Hello everybody and welcome to Timway Presents. Today I am going to live stream myself writing some code. And the plan is to write a puzzle solver, specifically a Sudoku solver. But slightly more versatile than just your standard Sudoku solver, I want to cover various Sudoku variants, including uh, Jigsaw Sudoku, uh, which looks like this. It's a Sudoku with irregular regions, uh, and various other rules, Thermometer Sudoku, you notice that I have all these YouTube videos open. These are all from a channel called Cracking the Cryptic, which I quite enjoy. And they have uh, visited and examined and showcased many of these Sudoku variants. So I've um, given a bit of a selection here, and I'm going to go through them. We're probably not going to be able to cover all of them today. Um, but I'm going to start with the Jigsaw Sudoku. But actually, I'm going to start right at the beginning. I'm going to uh, open Visual Studio. Now, I've already prepared um, a little solution here consisting of a library called Puzzle Solvers, which will eventually contain my puzzle solving algorithms that we're going to write today. And of course, a puzzle solver tester, which is going to be the program that we use to test that it actually works. We're going to use this to solve some Sudokus, uh, see if it gives us the right answer, see how long it takes, etc. Now, you will see that this still has the um, default name class one. So I'm just going to rename that to puzzle. Um, it will have automatically renamed the file. Uh, at the end, when we're done, all of my code will be available on GitHub. I've already created the um, uh, Git repository here. I'm going to paste the link to that in the chat. So if you, got, if you guys would like to take a look at that later, you can. I'm going to commit the code when we're finished. Um, so. Um, I'm going to head straight in. Okay, so let's take a look at, or let's think about what a puzzle needs to contain. A Sudoku puzzle obviously con consists of 81 cells, which are arranged in a 9x9 nine nine grid. So we definitely want an array of cells. But what do these cells contain? Well, um, we have givens, which are the numbers that are already written in the grid. And we have constraints, which is that, for example, every row and column needs to contain the numbers 1 to 9, etc. Okay, so every puzzle is going to consist of um, a size, which is literally just the number of cells. So in this case, that would be 81. But, you know, we want to keep this general so you can have uh, puzzles of different sizes. And we're going to have a list of constraints. All right, so I'm just going to have constraints here. And this constraint type is going to be a class that we have to write, which will enable us to express things like, for example, you can only have, uh, you can't have repeats in rows and columns or in uh, three by three areas, etc. So let's create this class. Um, ooh, there is actually already a class with that name, but we're not going to use that. Let's generate a new type with this name in a new file. And let's make it abstract. We want different types of constraints, and these different types of constraints are going to be derived classes from this constraint class. Um, it's complaining about XML comments. Let's see. I'm going to write those XML comments later. I think writing those uh, is outside of the scope of the stream. So let's um, immediately start by writing the obvious first constraint, which is a uniqueness constraint. So our uniqueness constraint obviously needs to be a, a derived from constraint, and it needs to be public because code outside of the library needs to be able to use it. And a uniqueness constraint consists of uh, the region in the puzzle it, within which uh, the digits are going to be unique. Right? So for example, in the case of this region up here, it's going to consist of the first seven cells plus those two extra cells. And of course, we're going to have uniqueness constraints for every row and for every column. All right. So um, since the, um, the, the, the puzzle class consists uh, literally of just a size, you know, it, the, the puzzle class doesn't need to know that the puzzle is rectangular. You know, it could be any irregular shape. We're going to concentrate on rectangular puzzles right now, obviously. But what I'm getting at is that the cells that the puzzle generator, the puzzle solver, is going to fill um, are just going to be indexed from 0 to 80. 
So there are 81 of them, and we just number them 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Okay, so the constraints only need to care uh, about the number of each cell, like the index of each cell. All right, so let's um, start by writing a uniqueness constraint, which um, uh, which needs to affect a certain number of cells. So these are the cells that are going to be affected. Um, and I, I think that is it, right? We really, that, that, that's the only information that the uniqueness constraint needs to contain. But obviously constraints need to be able to do something. They need to be able to tell the solver, um, you know, uh, when a constraint is violated, basically. All right, now let's take a quick look at how we're going to actually solve a puzzle. So um, we're going to need a um, function, and it's going to return an integer array, which is the solution, and it's a solve function. And we're going to solve a puzzle of a certain size with a certain number of constraints, which we've defined here. OK, now um, we usually assume that a puzzle has a single unique solution, but it's possible for a puzzle to not be unique, in which case it might return multiple solutions. So I'm going to make this an I enumerable, which means that we're going to enumerate the, um, uh, we, we're going to enumerate the solutions one at a time. And if it turns out that a puzzle is unsolvable because it has contradictions in it, then this will just return an empty I enumerable with no solutions in it. Okay. So now how is this going to work? We need to instantiate an array of cells. So we need to figure out, um, we, we, we need to have an area of memory where we store all of the digits that we've already placed. Okay, so um, the thing is, because this is an I enumerable, um, okay, well, let's, let's start by this. So we want an array of integers of the size size, obviously. And we're going to uh, initialize this with zeros. Wait, actually initializing this with zeros might be a problem. Um, because, you know, ideally we, we want to use the number 0 to 8 instead of 1 to 9 as would be typical in Sudoku. So I'm actually going to make this a nullable uh, int because that way I can express which cells uh, are already filled and which ones are not. The ones that are not filled will have a null int in it, a nullable integer. So uh, it starts out not filled at all. Okay. Now, the next thing we need to do is, as we're solving the Sudoku, like imagine, for example, we place a number, like we place, let's say we place the first given, the three here. This will immediately rule out a three everywhere else in the row, in the column, and in that area, obviously. So we need to keep track of which numbers are still allowed to be placed. So I'm going to call that allowed, right? And for every uh, cell, so we're going to have an array of size size, um, but each of them is going to have a, uh, uh, another array. Okay, so um, for example, right, I'm going to use a notepad here to visualize this a little. So let's say we have your standard Sudoku, and let's say we're looking at the top left uh, cell, right? That cell uh, could initially be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9, but then when we place a 3, Obviously, then that collapses it down to three. But then the cell, like to its right, let's say like this, can now be anything but a three. So we're going to have to rule out this three from consideration there. Now, the way we're going to do this is because it's kind of um, inefficient to deal with arrays of varying sizes where you remove elements. We're actually instead going to treat this as an array of Booleans. So we're going to say, you know, one is still allowed, two is still allowed, three is not allowed, right? So I'm going to use true and false to identify what can still be placed. Now you would, you might think that true is a good value to say you can still place that value, but I'm going to do the reverse. I'm going to use false to say that these values have not yet been used, so they're allowed. I'm going to use true to say this value is taken. And as a result, I'm going to call the variable uh, takens. So this tells me which uh, values have already been taken. 
Now, obviously, this will create a uh, two-dimensional array, but in the first dimension, all of them will be null. So we're going to have to instantiate all of these arrays now. So for each of the cells from zero to size, we're going to say takens i is a new Boolean array of the size. There we go. So these, of course, will all be initialized to false, so none of them are taken at the start. And now we are going to need a recursive algorithm that will uh, place the numbers one at a time and then execute all of the constraints for all of the numbers that we've placed. So for example, if we place a three, it will, it will tell the constraint, hey, you know, mark the cells that, aren't, that can no longer be threes. Um, and, and then we have to recurse. So we have to keep trying to place numbers until uh, we reach a point where we were able to place all of the numbers, which means that we have a valid solution. Okay, so I'm going to do this by declaring another enumerable, which is basically the actual recursive algorithm. And this one is going to take the cells array that we just created, the taken array, which is a two-dimensional array of booleans, um, and it's going to take an index of uh, the cell that we're currently looking at. Now, this means that at this point, I'm going to go through the cells in reading order, which I understand is not the most efficient way. We're going to look at a more efficient way to do this later, but for now, to keep the code simple, I'm going to go with this. So we're going to put that, uh, so we're going to return all of the uh, solutions that the solver found, given the cells, which are initially all empty, the takens, uh, and the index zero, because we want to start at the beginning. All right, this should be an array of uh, nullable integers. So far, so good. Now, before we even start the algorithm, there's something we should do. Because, you see, uh, if we already have a three in the top left corner as a given, then we already know that the rows and columns and the area cannot contain a three. So before we even start, we should ask the constraints to mark things off that can already no longer be the case, All right? So I'm going to say for each constraint in constraints, um, I'm going to say um, mark initial takens and give it, so I'm giving it the takens array, which I've already instantiated. And this function will modify that. Okay, now when I create this method, uh, it will create it in the abstract class. Now, obviously, I want this to be abstract because each of the constraints is going to do something different with it. Um, uh, the language that I'm using is C sharp. Uh, this is Visual Studio, which is an in integrated development environment for C sharp. Um, this is the language that I'm used to. Of course, you can use any other programming language, but I'm going to be using C sharp. All right, so our uniqueness constraint uh, is going to have to implement this, uh, this, this method. Um, not quite sure why it marked this as private. It probably shouldn't be private. I did mark it as private, so I should make it public. There you go. All right. So a uniqueness constraint uh, is not going to be able to mark anything initially taken unless we already know what values are in there, but we don't because the uniqueness constraint is separate from the given constraint, which I haven't actually created yet. So this, this method is just going to be empty. Um, <laughs> I see a range. That's, that's an interesting uh, comment. All right, so let's create another constraint, which we're going to use for the, for the givens. All right, we're just going to call this a given constraint, which means that one of the values is going to be uh, predetermined. Let's implement that, make that public. Now, a given constraint is going to have a, a location and the value. Okay, so this will say at location zero, which is the top left corner, the value is going to be two because we're going to use the digit zero to eight. Okay, so. Um, we're going to say that in the location, the value is taken. So we set that to true. 
Now at this point, oh, this is nonsense, right? This is not actually what we want to do because what this will say is we cannot put the value in that location. We want to say that we have to put that value in the location. So we're actually going to say, um, uh, we're actually going to say that all the other values cannot be taken. In order to do that, we're going to have to iterate over this array. So for each of the, uh, for each of the, no, 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 no. We, we still want just the takens array for the location that we're at. All right, and then in each place here, we want to set it to false if it is not equal to the value. We want to set it to true. Okay, so all of the values that are not the value of the given constraint are now taken. This way, the algorithm will, uh, will be forced to put a specific value into that cell, and then it will tell the constraints, like the row and column constraint, uh, to, uh, to, to mark all the rest of the row in the column as, you know, it can no longer be that value. So let's, um, let's write that piece of the code right here in our puzzle code. So the first thing that we want to do, uh, we are now looking at a specific cell given by the index. So th this is, I, I should really call this location, but I, I like to call it index because it's easier to type. So, um, So we're going to go through all the possible values that this um, uh, cell could potentially take. So we're going to look at this array at its index. And if at that index this value is taken, then we just continue. And i, of course, is the value that we're actually placing in the cell. OK, so let's try and put that value in. So at the location, which is ix, we're going to set the cell to that value. And then we're going to ask all of the constraints to update the taken thing. So we need a um, uh, mark taken. And this is going to have to take the, uh, the takens array, obviously, the um, location that we're at, and the value that we placed. Okay, so every time that we place a value, then the constraint is going to mark other cells as no longer possible. All right, now I am going to make another change to this method later, but for now, let's, uh, let's just do that. Okay, so we want this to be abstract, just like the other one. And then our, um, our given constraint is not going to uh, do anything because the given constraint only needs to mark initial takens, but then it is done. There is no, nothing else to do. So this is just going to be an empty method. But our uniqueness constraint, where the mark initial takens is uh, empty, this will now do something. OK, so we have our set of affected cells. So first, we need to make sure that the value that we placed is actually one of the affected cells, because if it isn't, then the uniqueness cons constraint doesn't apply. OK, so um, if um, affected cells does not contain, we're going to need a using for that, there we go. If it does not contain the index, then we don't care. But if it does contain the index, then for each cell in affected cells, if it is not the one that we just placed, then we need to set the taken value in that cell for that value to true. You know, I, I technically I don't even need this if, because once we've placed the value, uh, the algorithm is never going to look at the taken array for that cell anymore, so it doesn't really matter. But um, this, is, this, this makes sense, so I'm going to leave it. All right, so now we've got our uniqueness constraint and our given constraint. Um, Hello there, Red Penguin. Welcome to my stream. I hope that you will enjoy this uh, session today. Um, now, I, I do have to say I am getting a little annoyed at all these green underlines. So I'm quickly going to look at the properties for this project and change it so that it will not try to generate this XML documentation file. Uh, and then hopefully that will make these green lines bingo. It did make them disappear. All right. 
Now back to our solver. The reason it is complaining here is because we haven't uh, made it return any actual values yet, so we still need to do that. So we've marked ourselves. We want to mark the tokens. Now here's the thing: if we mark these tokens and then we find that placing this value was wrong, and the next iteration of the for loop is going to place a different value there, we kind of need to undo what this was doing, right? So the, the only way to do this is to take a copy of it first, because obviously, you know, we cannot possibly undo this because it, um, it overwrites values uh, here, which may or may not have been true even before the assignment. So the only way to do that is to take a copy of it. So I'm going to take um, a copy of the takens. Um, in fact, maybe I'm... I'm going to take a copy right here. So uh, taken copy is taken. Now for each of the arrays inside of taken, we need to take a copy of those. So this is the copy. And then we have, we have to have this apply to the copy so that it doesn't modify our original. Um, <laughs> thank you, Red Penguin. That's a very, um, kind thing to say. I feel like I'm sitting in a class like three years too early. <laughs> well, maybe it's never too early to learn. And um, it's certainly never too early to be uh, ahead of your classmates. Okay. So we've now got our copy. We've uh, marked all the cells as uh, taken from each of the constraints. And now we need to ask the solver recursively, can you find a solution for the rest of the puzzle? So for each solution that is generated by the solver, given the same cells, the same takens, uh, no, actually the copy of the takens that we've just modified, but one more on the index, we are going to yield return that solution. So this way, it will recursively go through the solve algorithm for the next cell, which is index plus one, and then any solution that was generated by that, we just return. So this way, it will sort of keep trying uh, more and more cells until it runs into a dead end, and then it will backtrack simply because this for loop will just, you know, if you, if you run into a cell which can no longer be filled, then uh, basically all of these will be true, so all of the for loop iterations will be skipped, and, and this will not return anything, um, and, and then, you know, one, one level up, it will go to the next iteration. For you. Okay, so this far so good. Now there is one last thing that is missing. This increment here, obviously, it will keep incrementing until it reaches the end of the grid. So uh, down here, when we're at cell number eighty, we increment it by one, and we will reach cell number eighty-one, which doesn't exist. We only have cells numbered from zero to eighty, which is eighty-one of them, right? But so cell number eighty-one is the first one that doesn't exist. So at the start of this recursive call, we need to check if the index is equal to the size. And if so, we need to say, hey, we found a solution and not do anything else. So how do we say that we found a solution? Well, we've got our cells, which at this point should all be filled, but they are nullable integers and we want non-nullable integers. But since they should all be filled, they should all not have a null in them. So we can actually just yield return our cells in which every value is uh, its, its value. Okay, so this dot value removes the nullability. It will throw an exception if any of these values is null, right? Uh, but we don't expect any of them to be null, so we'll just unnullify, uh, unnullable, unnullifify, is that even a word, uh, <laughs> them? And uh, that, that will give us the um, array of integers that we want. So this should be a working solver already, except that it is going to be hideously slow. But I'm going to try it out anyway, and I'm going to try it on a super easy uh, Sudoku. Um, I don't know how easy this one is, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, you know what, here's what I'll do. I'll find, I should have prepared this. I'm going to uh, take a look at this Cracking the Cryptic YouTube channel. And I'm just going to find some random video in which they solve uh, a standard Sudoku uh, with no... Um, okay, so this one here, for example. 
and I'm going to scroll like near the end of the video where basically a lot of the values have already been filled in and I'm going to pretend that all of them were given and that will make for a very very easy Sudoku and then you know I'll, I'll successively remove some of these givens and see at which point I reach the point where the algorithm takes too long okay so let's uh, let's get rid of this we don't need that anymore and let's write down all these numbers that we have here right now. 59278 and 9827.543, 27583415, 27583415. Uh, if I make a typo, please let me know. I might not notice because I'm trying to go fast here because this is probably boring to watch. Uh, 964285 and then 452879. One eight one nine five four. Okay, so um, I'm going to remove all of the new lines from this, so it's just one blob of data. And now I'm going to go to my puzzle solver tester program, and I am going to instantiate a new puzzle. This puzzle has oops. This puzzle has a size of eighty one. And I'm going to give it constraints. I'm, I'm going to do that in a second. So for now, let's just uh, put empty there. And then when I solve it, um, oh, that's right. The givens are also constraints. Okay. So um, right. Okay. So for each solution in puzzle or solve. I'll put the solution. Now the solution is going to be an integer array, so I'm going to join string this with um, uh, spaces. Come on, no, no. Um, okay, apparently there is a reference to a uh, library missing. No, it's not. All right. Um, I probably should have uh, checked this. Oh, I think I know what's going on. Let's check what. Uh, no, the framework num framework reference is correct. Framework uh, version. Okay, maybe maybe join string is not in that library as I thought it would, uh, but actually it is. It's right there. Okay, so why is that not working? Let's let's figure this out using rtutil extension. Okay, it did allow me to autocomplete that, so it does know the. Uh, oh, and now it's right. Okay, so it was just the auto completion thingy that that failed. Okay, that's good. Let's remove all the unused usings. Okay. Now, this obviously will give us a string of all of the numbers, but we want it in a nice 9x9 nine nine thing. So I'm going to split this into chunks of 9, and then for each, uh, for each of those chunks, we are going to uh, join them with spaces, and then the whole thing we're going to join with new lines. That way we're going to see the Sudoku. All right, this should probably be uh, system.link. There you go. Okay. Now we need to write the actual constraints. Now, writing all of these here um, as a separate instantiation of given constraint is going to be uh, a bit of a bitch. So I'm going to write a helper function, um, which is going to be a static function that gives me a, uh, a enumerable, enumerable of constraints. Uh, let's add that. Yes, um, and we're going to have uh, givens, right? And I'm going to going to do this. Okay, so the string is going to be expected to be in this kind of format, and for every dot, I'm going to ignore the uh, the thing because it's not a given, and for every digit, I'm going to return a uh, new uh, given constraint in which in which the location is, of course, I still have to decide what the location is, and the value then, of course, is the, um, uh, the relevant position in that string uh, minus the uh, one character. So it will actually number them from zero, okay? So going from zero to the length of the string, this should be it, okay? So each character in the string, ah, okay, and if, if that is not a dot, there you go. Now, obviously, this will, this will return garbage if I have anything other than dots and digits in the string. So I think I'm going to um, 
uh, put a safeguard for that in here. So if it is equal to a dot, then do nothing. That's actually the curly theorem, so it's a bit more readable. Else, if it is uh, between 1 and 9, there we go, then we do this. Else, we're going to throw a new invalid operation exception, and we're going to say uh, the uh, given constraints must use digits 1 to 9 or a period to signify no good. Okay. Now, um, I can probably make this a little more readable if I change this. So now I can just change the condition here and get rid of this. Okay, so that's a little shorter. Okay, so now we have an enumerable of constraints for the givens, but we still need the constraints for the actual Sudoku. So let's also create a um, uh, enumerable of constraints for uh, standard Sudoku. I'm going. To, should I just stand? No, I, I think calling it Sudoku is fine. Uh, if it's not called anything other than Sudoku, then it's assumed to be a standard Sudoku. Okay, so we want row constraints, we want column constraints, and we want uh, three by three area constraints. All of them are going to be a uniqueness constraint. All right. Now, um, for each of the rows from zero to nine, we're going to uh, create a, a uniqueness constraint, which is going to affect the cells in that row. Now, um, if we're in row i, then the affected cells are actually all of the numbers um, from one, there, all of the numbers from zero to nine. So that would be the column. Okay, so this is the row. Okay, so now we have a row and a column, um, and we want the row times nine plus the column. This is how we. Uh, yeah, okay, so this will give us nine values. So we need to turn that into an array, and here we have our uniqueness constraint. And now we do the same thing for the columns. So now we have this, except that now it's um, like that. So the formula is the same, right? But row and column here are swapped, so that, that should work. And then um, so these are the rows. These are the columns. I can type, I swear. And then we have the three by three regions. All right, so for, um, let's see. Um, let's go x from zero to three and then y from zero to three. So um, uh, we want a uniqueness constraint in which the affected cells are, now let's think, okay, so we, Let's say we're at zero, zero. So we want the top left three by three region. And we want the values zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to map onto it like this. All right. So let's get rid of that marking. All right. So for all of the numbers from zero to nine, we're going to turn that into an array at the end. Okay. So this is an index. Okay. So these numbers, 0 to 9, are going to um, um, refer to the positions within the 3 by 3 like this, okay? Which means that I can use uh, uh, modulo 3 to get the column, and I can divide by 3 to get the row. You will notice that if you modulo 3, you get 0, 1, 2 here, and then you get 0, 1, 2 here, and 0, 1, 2 here. So that gives you the column. And dividing by 3, because they're integers, is going to round down because it's integer division. So all of these are going to, div uh, going to result in zero. And then this is the first one that results in one. And these will also result in one because it gets rounded down. And these will result in two. So that gives us the row, zero, one, and two. Okay? So um, the column within the three by three uh, region, we need to add to that three times the position of the three by three region that we want. And then we want nine times the row. Now the row is going to be the row within the three by three region plus the row of the three by three region we're in. So that 
should be it. That should be our uniqueness constraint for that. So now we have a function Sudoku and a function Gip. So if we now go back to our tester program, um, we probably uh, want to do this constraint dot uh, and then we concatenate onto that the uh, givens which we've written down here, and then turn that into an array. Okay, I'm a little nervous now because throughout this entire time I've been writing code and I've not run any of the code. If I run this code now, it is possible that I've made a mistake and it's just going to crash, and it's possible that I've made a mistake and it's just going to take forever. So I'm going to run the risk and run the program and see what happens. And it turns out it finds quite a lot of solutions. Let me, um, let me put new lines in between the solutions. In fact, let me uh, break the debugger after the first solution that it finds. And we will notice that, uh, that that seems like a perfectly valid Sudoku to me. This has all the unique digits, this has all the unique digits, etc. So the problem is um, later down. We will notice that the last digit here keeps increasing, 79, 80. Obviously, that's not supposed to happen. Uh, that last number is supposed to be a number from 0 to 9, uh, 0 to 8, actually. Okay, so I think, I think all the rest of these Sudokus are all identical, and it's only the bottom right cell that has this problem. And you'll notice that it doesn't even include any of the digits 0 to 8 except for the one that is probably the right answer. In fact, let's go to the end of the video. Um, ooh, that is not the right answer. Well, that is surprising. Let's see. Um, Oh, well, that is very surprising indeed. It did not find the same answer as the, as the video did. Um, it, it's possible that I made a mistake in my givens, I guess. Um, but uh, there are 81 of them, so it's unlikely. So let me just scroll back. Unfortunately, I neglected to write down the exact time. So I'm just going to... I'm just going to um, go from here. Okay, so this is the first row. This is the second row. Aha. I did, in fact, put this uh, 2 and the 7 in a wrong place. In a completely wrong place. OK, so th that would explain the problem then, I guess. Um, now, this looks very different. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. All right. Um, I, I guess I just typed it up wrong. Oh, I'm already... Oh, shit. I'm, okay, I'm in the next row. That was a uh, kink in my vision. All right. Let's look at the rest of this. And that's a 7, 8, blank, 5, blank, blank, 6, blank, blank. It seems that I did not make a mistake here. But of course, even with a mistake, the algorithm shouldn't be outputting grids in which the bottom right corner is, um, you know, is like ridiculous numbers. So let's actually take a look at the algorithm and let's try and see if we can find out why that last value is um, uh, increasing. So presumably, um, so I. Uh, let me put a breakpoint here if index is equal to size minus 1, which is, of course, the index of the bottom right corner. So if that happens, let's put a debugger break here. OK. And uh, let's take a look at this. OK, so apparently, interesting. Very interesting. Did I, I, I guess I just instantiated arrays that are Bingo, size. Of course, that shouldn't be size. So our puzzle, our puzzle is going to need a minimum value and a maximum value that the cells can contain. So there we go. Now, when we solve this, we are going to use values from 0 to whatever. So um, I'm going to... 
Hmm. Hello, Goofy. Welcome to the stream. Uh, you may have missed the first 40 minutes, but that's okay because we haven't written much yet. Um, did you just arrive? Um, what did you miss? Okay, you missed... Um, I, I basically already wrote the first sort of primitive version of the uh, solver, which can only do sort of standard Sudoku so far. And it has a bug, which I'm trying to fix. So the bug that it had is that it allowed all of the values in the Sudoku to have all of the values from 0 to 80 uh, instead of 0 to 8, which is what we want, because we want nine different values. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to um, um, OK, so uh, in the public interface, this, um, this class is going to have a min value and a max value. But internally, it's going to use uh, 0 to whatever it needs. And then here, I'm going to translate all of the solutions that it found. OK, so um, I'm going to say there is a private in actual max. Well, actually, I'll, I'll just call it max. It's easier to type. And then when we try to solve it, we're going to set max to max value minus min value. So if the max value is 9 and the min value is um, uh, 1, then it will subtract 1 and then the max value is 8. Um, however, I'm going to add 1, so take it back to 9, because that will give me the number of possible values that it can have. So actually, maybe I should call it numvals, the number of values that can be placed in the cell. And then that, of course, is what the size of this array should be. OK, and then here, um, oh yeah, and also oh yeah, here I can just take the length of the array, so that's good. All right, but here, for each solution that was found, I'm going to have to uh, change all of the values by adding uh, the min value. And that will give us the values that we actually wanted. All right, so turn that into an array, turn that into an array. No, don't turn that into an array. That's just, we want to, um, you know, lazy enumerate the uh, enumerable. Uh, why don't you build up on your existing solver? Um, because I wanted to show how the solver is written. And in fact, I wanted to write an entirely new solver. There are a few ideas that I had. Um, I, so I wanted to show everyone how it's done. And there are some ideas that I have that it would be less interesting to see me sort of restructure the existing solver and more interesting to just write it from, from scratch. OK, so we have, um, I, I hope I don't lose my train of thought here. OK, so um, we now have our solver algorithm, which will um, generate Sudokus with the values from 0 to 8. And then this code here will add the min value. So th this means that, hmm, which language is this? This is C sharp. The language is C sharp. Um, you, of course, you, know, you could write the same algorithm in any language. I'm just used to C sharp, so that's what, what I'm going to go with. OK, um, so my problem right now is that right here, you know, I'm going to uh, tell the puzzle that its uh, min value, oops, dot min value is going to be one and its max value is going to be nine. But in this string here, um, you know, I'm using the values one to nine, obviously, but this one here is going to subtract one and turn it into values uh, from, yeah. So I'm going to change this to this so that, um, so that the values are actually the numbers one to nine. Um, and then when I, um, hmm, let me see, the given constraint needs to know what the min value is going to be, right? So I'm going to pass the uh, min value in here, where you mark initial takers. Um, hmm, should I really do that? Let, let me think about this. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. OK, so I'm just going to subtract. Uh, let's see, we want to go to this. Minus min value, then uh, plus min value. 
Right, so i plus min value is actually the real value that we're looking at, the real give. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Okay, th this should be right. Ooh, famous last words. Okay, so now if I run this, um, we still have, oh, okay, so, um, wait, what did I? Let's see, no similar. Oh, I see. I need to add the same parameter to the abstract declaration here, obviously. And now it will complain that the uniqueness constraint, uh, this one here, uh, doesn't also have that parameter. There you go. Um, and then this one here needs to actually pass it in. There you go. Okay. Index out of bounds. All right. Uh, this is because that should actually be enough. Right, we, we're going through the values from zero to, you know, how, however many we need, and that's the index we use in this array. But the value here is going to be the, you know, the, the, the publicly visible value, which is, of course, I plus min value. So I think this, this should be. All right, we have, all right, I don't need that debug code anymore. Um, okay, so I'm running the program and it immediately exits, which strongly suggests that it has found the correct solution. So I'm going to put a message here saying done, uh, press enter to exit, and then put a read line there so that it'll wait. And here we go, we have our solution. Now let's see if the solution is correct now. You will notice that this time it actually uses the numbers one to nine, so we can uh, more easily uh, check that this is correct. Uh, 3461592781982765433. Uh, this also explains why our previous solution was totally wrong. It's because the uniqueness constraint was assuming that you can have the numbers 0 to 80 uh, in any row column or um, uh, thing. All right, so here we go. This is the correct answer. So now let's scroll a bit back uh, in, in this uh, video and put a, a bit fewer of these givens in. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to. Uh, sprinkle this with a few dots here and there. So that's nine eight dot seven. Then we have dot dot eight four one dot two seven eight. Uh, what was uh, how's the string structure? Why didn't you build up on your existing? So oh right. Um, what was your phone that? Oh, did did you? I I do apologize. It's my audio doing um doing things. I'm, I'm going to put the phone on a different desk so it won't affect the microphone. Uh, please do let me know if you hear more of that. Okay, 4.28 uh, and then 78.96. That's an 8428918195. Eight, Okay, so let's try that with all of the new lines gone. Whoops, I don't want to save that file. I just want to put this here. Okay, so now it appears shorter because quite a few of the digits are now dots, which are, of course, uh, less narrow. So how is the string structured? It's literally just the 81 cells that belong to the Sudoku. And for every cell that we have a given, we put a digit. And every cell that we don't have a given, we put a dot. All right, so let's run this. And now you can see that it takes quite a bit longer to find the answer, even though uh, we have more givens than the Sudoku theoretically needs. So um, the reason this is slow is because it will examine uh, the cells in reading order. And the first cell in the top left corner could in theory be anything, right? Actually, okay, in this case, it has a three, but then the next value, like let's say this cell here, which is not given, it will try all the possible values and then move on to the next one. Uh, this way, it will ignore uh, the, um, you know, you can solve it faster if you find a cell somewhere which can only be like one or two values. And we should really look at those values first. Okay, here we go. It has finally found the solution after, uh, what was this? This was probably about uh, 20, 30 seconds. Is there a way to prove how many given a Sudoku needs at least? Well, obviously, it needs at least um, eight, right? Because you need to know what the eight digits are. Otherwise, you can just 
we renumber the numbers. But I think that um, you actually need something like 15 or 16. I, I don't know if there is a way to prove it. Okay. So um, as you can see, the algorithm still found the solution within you know, less than a minute, so it's kind of reasonable. But we are going to try and make it faster. So this is now going to be, uh, oops, that is not where I wanted to go, I want to go to solve. This is going to be the part where my previous solver um, uh, you know, ha had a shortcoming. So what I'm about to do now is something uh, that my previous solver didn't do. Namely, instead of going through them in reading order here, I am going to look for the one that has the fewest possibilities left. Okay, so I'm going to remove this. I'm going to remove the zero here. And I'm going to um, find out which cell has the fewest possible um, uh, values. So the fewest possible values. Um, are going to be, so I'm, I'm going to start with this because there's obviously going to be one that is less than that. Um, what would be funny is to see what the solver says the solution is when you don't give any givens. Um, well, it will uh, generate the first Sudoku in sort of numerical order, right? It will do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in the first row, and then, um, thank you, Akugumo. So apparently, 17 is the least number of. Uh, Clues probably. Uh, in fact, let's go to Google Images and see if we can find a 16 given Sudoku. Um, okay. Um, is he 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17? Ah, okay, that's 17. So it, it, this probably is saying that it's not possible to have a Sudoku with 16 clues. So it's probably 70. All right, so back to this. So the fewest possible values, and then the, um, uh, the, the uh, location, of course, is going to be the, the index of that cell. And I'm going to set that to minus one so that we can uh, see if it's invalid. Okay, so now let's go through all of the cells and find out the number of values that are still valid in that cell. All right, that would be um, the, the taken for that cell, which is i, uh, and then count the number of false, right? So we count how many of them are false, like that. If that count is smaller than the one we've already found, then the index is i, and the fewest possible values is that count. And this means at the end of this loop, first of all, if uh, uh, the fewest possible values is actually a zero, then it means that we've reached a contradiction. It means that we've found a cell that can no longer be filled. So we're going to have to break out there. Um, uh, however, if um, ix is still equal to negative one after all of this, then it means that we've actually already filled all of the cells and we're done. In which case we want to uh, return the solution, which is, uh, I, I must have deleted that part of the code. So we want to uh, we we want to do what we did before, which is to um, you know make them not be uh, nullable anymore, and then you'll break. Okay, but now there is one other problem, which is that we are now looking at all the cells, but we should only be looking at the cells that we haven't already visited. So if cells of i is not equal to null, then ignore that cell. That way, if all of them are not equal to null, ix will still be negative one, and then this will trigger. So, um, so one issue that we have now is that this cells array uh, starts out with nulls, obviously, but then when we place a value here, um, we are leaving the value in. So what we actually have to do is, after this for loop, we're going to have to set it back to null uh, for the backtracking to do the right thing. All right, so I'm going to run this now. And as you can see, it, it solved that Sudoku in like no time. That, that took like a fraction of a second. OK, now let's go back to the start of this video and have only the actual givens that were originally in the puzzle. And let's see how quickly this algorithm can find the solution to this. 
let's see, 5, 2, 8, 4, 7, 6, 9, 6, 8, um, 2, 9, 1, 1, 9, 5. So these are the actual givens. Let's copy and paste that uh, into here. And now if we run this again, it will solve this in pretty much no time. I am actually impressed by this myself. I did not expect it to, to go this, uh, this fast. Okay, so now, uh, now we have a solver for, ooh, here's a 17, yeah, 17, yeah, we already found a 17 clue Sudoku in the uh, uh, Google search results earlier. Uh, oh, I see, uh, maybe you're asking me to run that through the um, solver. I guess I can do that. Uh, let's see how long it takes. I suspect that this will probably take a, a significant amount longer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 5. And then 4, 1, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 7, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 4. Okay, so these are the givens for this Sudoku. Um, let's see how quickly it can do that. All right, let's keep a copy of the other one just so that we can come back to it later and run this. And as I suspected, this takes quite, quite a fair bit longer. Uh, okay, let's actually measure how long that took. All right, so we have a start time, which is uh, the time now. And then this took a uh, start time minus uh, no, it's the current time minus the start time, and then the seconds uh, with only one uh, decimal point. All right, there you go. And then uh, finish in that many seconds. Here we go. Okay, it took 4.2 seconds, and it finished in 5.7. Now, um, it will always take 4.2 seconds because, you know, it, it goes through the values in the same order every time. We could randomize this so that it would sometimes find the solution quicker. But, um, you know, that would just be a gimmick. That's not really important. Could you do a Sudoku where there are more than one solution to see what... Okay, I can do that. Let's just change this uh, one here uh, to a dot. And that will probably make it... There you go. Uh, we've got tons and tons of solutions now. I'm actually surprised it's that many. But, but there you go. So just changing that one digit actually means that we have tons and tons of solutions. So let's actually see how many solutions that gives us. Um, so let's count them. And I'm going to not output them all because that would take ages to scroll through. Um, found uh, count solutions in that many seconds. So this will probably still take about five or six seconds like it did before. That's my guess anyway. Actually, it might take 10 times as long or nine times as long because, uh, you know, that one cell that we left out can be any one of those 10 values. Uh, sorry, nine values. Okay, it's taking a fair bit longer than I expected. Um, all right, let's, let's keep it running in the background and we will come back to it, I guess. In the meantime, I'm going to write myself a little helper method because you see, every time that I ran the solver, I needed to say constraint.sudoku and then concat and then the givens. I want to be able to have just a single solve method that will just solve a Sudoku that I give. Oh, it still hasn't found any. It, well, actually, it has found tons. And it's, all right, let's actually uh, put a breakpoint here and see how many it has already found. Oh, look at that. There are 160,000 possible solutions already. So um, there you go. Uh, let's, let's try the reverse with, I've, I've exited the program, I've aborted the program. But let's try this with the easier Sudoku that was given in the video. Let's just remove that last digit here. And there we go. That finds 39 solutions in pretty much no time. Right? And with the five in it, bang. It finds one solution in less than a tenth of a second. Right, so I guess we can output these again. Here we go. Um, uh, yeah. I don't really need to do that, do I? Okay. Um, 
So with, with that five gone, here are the 39 possible solutions that it finds within a tenth of a second. How about no solution? Okay, so we know that in the correct solution, the bottom right uh, square needs to be a two. So if I put a three there, then in pretty much no time, it will say found zero solutions. It will just say zero solutions because it didn't find any. Okay, so of course I can try the same thing with the, uh, um, you know, with this uh, Sudoku here. Uh, it's, oh yeah, this is, oh, where was it? Was it a one here, I think? There we go. Okay, so this was the original Sudoku. So the bottom right is a six. So if I change that to a seven, for example, then uh, within 0 0.6 seconds, it uh, determines that this is unsolvable. I think that is pretty darn efficient. Okay, so now I want to make myself a helper method that will literally just solve the Sudoku uh, given just this string. So I don't have to do all of this path. All right, so let's copy this and go to puzzle and create ourselves a um, public static uh, solve Sudoku. Uh, we want an i enumerable of integer arrays and we want an array of givens. Well, actually, yeah, okay, I'm going to make two versions of this. One of them will take an integer, a uh, nullable integer array, and the other one will take a string, um, which is, of course, this. Um, okay, so this is just going to return uh, solve Sudoku with um, the givens from the string. So we're just going to copy this code here. Um, now, actually, I'm going to rewrite this because I can actually rewrite this in the same line. So first of all, let's make sure that the uh, characters are all either dots or um, between 1 and 9. And let's also make sure that the length is equal to 81, because that's what we expect for a standard Sudoku. If that is not the case, then I'm going to throw an argument exception, saying that the, uh, the parameter givens has the following problem. Uh, givens must be length 81 and contain only digits 1 to 9 and periods uh, for no given. Right, and then we solve the Sudoku by saying givens.select. So for each character, if it is a dot, we're going to have a nullable int that is null. Otherwise, it's literally just uh, subtract the character zero, turn that into an array, and then call this function. And this function will instantiate the puzzle. And by the way, I can uh, abbreviate this a bit uh, like this. Uh, max value equals nine, there you go. Okay, so we want the constraints to be standard Sudoku uh, concatenate with givens. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to say enumerable.range uh, 0 to 81 um, givens i. So for each of these values, we want a uh, given constraint whose location is i and the value is given's i value, but only in those cases where uh, given's i is not null. There you go. All right. That's our constraints. And then we just return puzzle.solve. Um, solve. There you go. OK, uh, we need to check here that, um, OK, so first of all, if given's is null, then we want to throw an argument null exception. We probably should do that here too, if givens is null. And then if givens.length is not equal to 81, we're going to throw an argument exception very much like this one. Givens must have length 81 and contain only digits 1 to 9 uh, and nulls for no given. OK, so if givens length uh, Right, if given length is not uh, or any, uh, right, not all. There you go. I, I completely inverted the uh, condition there. All right, so if given length is not equal to 81 or 
not all of them are uh, either null, and this of course is a nullable value, or value greater or equal to one and value less than or equal to nine. There you go. So now in my main program, I can get rid of all of this code here. I can copy this. And here I'll just say solve. Uh, uh, can I? Okay, puzzle dot solve Sudoku givens. And now if I run this, it does the same thing as before. It takes about five seconds, I think it was. There we go, four point three seconds. After five point seven seconds, it decided it's unique. All right. What does it do in that one second between printing the Sudoku and saying it found one solution? In that one second, it uh, ex examines the rest of the search space to find further solutions, right? So the 4.2 seconds is uh, the time until it finds the first solution. And the 5.7 seconds is the time that it takes to prove that that is actually the only solution. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's not doing nothing during those one, uh, 1.5 seconds, it's proving that the solution is unique. That's what it does. Okay. Now, uh, now we are going to do the, um, the, the jigsaw Sudoku, the, uh, this one here. So we are going to have to write a way to, um, um, uh, to encode these um, uniqueness constraints or these regions. Um, and I'm going to use a notation or come up with a notation for it. Um, you see, I can, uh, I can refer to the rows of the Sudokus by numbering them one to nine. And I can refer to the columns as using letters from A to I. Uh, and that way I can refer to any cell, such as, for example, the top left would be A1. And then I can say, like, for example, that that, that first region here, this, this part of the first uh, jigsaw, goes from A1 to uh, G1, which I can abbreviate as just A, A to G1. And then it also has uh, Echo 2 and Golf 2, right? So that would be the first region. So I'm going to write some code that will allow me to express the regions in that way. So, um, uh, so we, we have our solve Sudoku. So let's create another one called uh, solve jigsaw Sudoku, which will take a list of strings uh, for those regions, okay? So we're gonna say solve jigsaw Sudoku, and we're going to have a string array of uh, regions. Oops. Uh, welcome back, Kyokrisi and uh, Red Penguin. Okay, so in that jigsaw Sudoku, we are now going to uh, okay, so first of all, we still need to make sure that this is the case. This is the same as in the original Sudoku. Um, and, uh, you know, it just occurred to me that uh, Solve Sudoku could actually just use Solve Jigsaw Sudoku internally. But anyway, I'll, I'll, um, uh, right, let's, let's not get too uh, um, distracted. So our puzzle constraints are not going to be the standard Sudoku constraints, but we, <coughs> excuse me, but we are going to use the uh, row and column constraints, obviously. So I'm going to um, split this up. Now, a puzzle in which only the rows and columns are unique, but not necessarily the, um, uh, the, the three by three regions, is actually known as a Latin square. So I'm just going to call it that. And then in Sudoku, I can just say, um, for each constraint in uh, Latin square. There you go. Okay. So for the jigsaw Sudoku, I want the um, Latin square uh, constraints. And then uh, I want each of the, each of the regions, I want to parse these strings. Uh, thank you, Goofy. That's very kind. Thank you for the host. Um, that, is, uh, that is awesome. Okay, so let's actually create a list of constraints so, so that I don't have to do it in, you know, dot .concat and stuff. So um, we start out with uh, the Latin square, which is this. Um, 
and then here I'm going to turn that list into an array. So, okay, um, so for each region in regions, um, so var affected squares is going to be a list of integers. And now we want to parse that string. We want that string to be in a format like this. So we're first going to split it at the commas, right? And then uh, we, we're going to examine each part. So for each region in region. So um, for each part in region.split commas. Okay, we expect each of these parts to have either a letter or two letters with a hyphen in between, followed by either a single number or two numbers with a hyphen in between. And of course, the letters need to be A to I and the numbers need to be one to nine. Okay, so we're going to use a regular expression to uh, parse this. Uh, here we go. We're going to match the part against the following regular expression. So we're going to allow white space just uh, out of courtesy. So you can actually you know, do this if you want to just for readability. And at the start, we have a letter, which is A to I, uh, followed optionally by a minus sign, followed by another letter, A to I. Um, so that would be the uh, letters part. And we... Um, I'm going to give these names, right? So this I'm going to call a column, and this I'm going to call a column R for range, because it's a range of columns. All right, and then we're going to do the same thing with the digits, right? So for the row, we're going to have digits one to nine, uh, followed optionally by a minus sign, um, with another digit one two nine okay and again out of courtesy i'm just going to allow extra white spaces around the uh, minus signs you know just in case you want to do like this i suppose um that's fine by me i don't care so if this doesn't uh, match then i'm going to uh, throw an argument exception to say that this is not uh, a valid uh, and not a valid format. Okay, so um, uh, the region this is not in a valid format. Um, expected a column, column A to I, or a region of columns, uh, e.g. A to D. All right, let's unconfuse this. Uh, followed by um a row one to nine or region of rows i should i should call it a range of rows right? a range there you go eg one two four dot so that's the valid format sudoku solver right um um Aha, hello, Lopsidation. I, I guess that you only just joined and you didn't see what we've been doing. Uh, there is nothing uh, as complicated as a um, SAT solver there. Depth first search uh, is, is indeed what it is. Um, I, I can just quickly show you the code here. We have this um, recursive function here, which will go through all the possibilities in a square after finding which one has the fewest possibilities and then it just calls itself recursively. That's the meat of the algorithm so far. And right now we are writing code that will allow us to define constraints. Okay, so if this did succeed, then we can, uh, so uh, for uh, each column from, uh, okay, so, okay, so the column obviously is going to be um, this minus, a. Uh, okay, so it's going to be a single character, so we're just going to take the first character of that, subtract A, and this is the first column. All right now, um, the column range uh, is going to depend on whether call R 
had a success. If so, then I can use its value and subtract a. Uh, in uh, in other cases, I'm going to make this a nullable. Image. And again, same problem as before. All right, then the same is true for the rows, obviously. So we want this, we want this, and we want to subtract the number one this time because we want to actually internally number the rows from uh, zero to eight so that we can do the correct mathematics to find the right cells in the right place. Uh, hello, Epic Toast. Uh, welcome to the stream. Uh, thank you for the host, QCreasy. I do appreciate that. Okay, now for um, uh, C going to the, from column two. Um, well, if we have a range, then we want to use that. But if not, then we're just going to use the column. And we have to make this a less than or equal to so that it will include the place where we are. Now, why is this? Um, ah, okay. So I guess I have to put that in parentheses. That works. So for each of those, and then for each. Uh, for each value between the row in uh, in the range, uh, we are going to add um, column plus nine times row. There we go. Now, obviously, this assumes that the size of the Sudoku is still going to be nine by nine. Like I said, I, I actually kind of wanted this to be more versatile. So I guess in the future, I'll write a more a generic one where you can actually have an in size here, but I'm not going to do that just now just to keep it simple. Okay, so that's the affected squares, and then we want to add a uh, uniqueness constraint where the affected squares, um, oh, sorry, new uniqueness constraint where the affected cells uh, are equal to, yeah, I call that affected squares instead of cells, typical. Uh, change that to an array and rename that because they really should be called cells. That makes more sense. Um, what does minus a do? Well, notice that I put the a in single quotes. This means that this refers to the character, capital A. And the character, capital A, has a certain um, uh, ASCII value or Unicode value which happens to be 65, but you know, the, the beauty here is that I don't need to care what the value is, I can just subtract it. And that way, you know, if this is a capital A and I subtract the capital A, I get zero. And then for the capital B, I get one, capital C, I get two, etc. So this calculation just allows me to uh, turn the numbers, turn the letters A to I into the numbers zero to eight. That's what that does. Okay, so far so good. Now, obviously, it's complaining because I shouldn't really be yield returning these. I want to uh, add them to my list here. Constraints that add. There you go. So now we have these uh, uniqueness constraints with affected cells being that. Um, and then we instantiate our puzzle with all of the constraints, which includes the uniqueness constraints as well as the Latin square constraints. And then we solve it. So let's see if that will work out of the box. Okay. So. I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, start a little bit of a, um, uh, what's it called, a unit test uh, sort of thing. So for the standard Sudoku, I'm going to have a text fixture. Uh, see if I can, yeah, I suspected as much. I don't, I don't have the correct um, reference to the library, so I'll, I'll put that in later, but I can still, uh, make that oops, uh, make that public. Actually, I don't really need that to be public. I only need this to be public. Public void test Sudoku. All right. Um, so this is the Sudoku that we had, which is a very difficult one. Um, it would probably be preferable if I don't, you know, if if the unit test didn't take that long. So I I'm gonna pick. Uh, a Sudoku that is easier, so I'm gonna pick this one. Um, so if I if I undo here, I'll probably there we go. This this is the one that I want. Okay. Now I, I cannot redo because okay. So in here, I'm going to say solutions equals uh, puzzle. Yeah, puzzle solvers is the namespace. That's right, and puzzles. So I'm, I'm gonna 
do this to add the using at the top. I uh, solve Sudoku. Uh, I want these givens. And then I'm just immediately going to turn it into an array. And then I'm going to assert, which, um, aha, aha, bingo. I can literally just install that. And um, this didn't take long at all. That is actually quite amazing. So I bet that I can now add my text picture thing here. There you go. Oops, test, there you go. And then I can assert that uh, solutions. First of all, I want to assert that it's not null, which obviously it will never be, uh, is not null solutions. Uh, and I want to make sure that there is actually exactly one solution. Um, and then I want to assert uh, that uh, solutions is actually equal to the actual solution that I need, which is, um, yeah, I suppose if I just run this code, I can get the solution there, run this, this is the solution. Let's take that, uh, remove all of the uh, new lines, remove all of the spaces. I actually don't remove all of the spaces. Uh, let's change them all into commas, uh, and then we can just assert that this is equal to that, all right? Solution zero, obviously. And here we have our first unit test. And obviously for the other, um, you know, puzzle types, uh, we're gonna just keep adding new um, unit tests. But for now, we'll use this um, uh, th this main function to run our code. So we want to uh, solve a jigsaw Sudoku. So this time the givens are, go here, right? This time the givens are seven, six, eight. Uh, Right, I hope I didn't mess up. So these are the um, givens, bang. And uh, now we need to define the region. So I'm actually gonna like do this so we can kind of see the regions while we do this. Can I make the video smaller? I suppose I can make Firefox smaller, there we go. Okay, this is better. Okay, so these are the givens. And now we need regions. Now the first region um, is going to be here along the top. You know, uh, to make sure that um, to make sure that I don't accidentally duplicate a region, I'm actually going to put this in um, uh, paint so that I can mark it when when it's done. So here we go. That's our Visual Studio. Uh, here's our paint. All right. Let's get rid of these extra. And let's keep that. Okay, so now I can use the uh, bucket um, to to mark things that I've already done, which I guess I'll mark. I can use. I can do this. All right. Let's also make sure the tolerance isn't uh, too high. Okay, so the first region that I've just marked is alpha to golf one followed by echo two and golf two so these have to be unique um so why is it complaining here cannot convert from string to integer array okay so you know here's something that i'll do i'll actually write a, um, a function that will translate the givens from uh, string uh, uh, a string representation and we're going to use this obviously, so we can't have it be null. Okay, these are the givens, um, and then I don't actually need this. I can literally just uh, right. Okay, so this is what I want to return here. So each of the characters is either a dot or a character, and then here I'm going to say translate givens. Right, this needs to be static. Then I can use that, translate the givens, there you go. 
Um, yep, and that way I don't need to write a set. You know, actually, I don't even need this, right? Next time I write a Sudoku, I can literally just call translate givens myself, uh, you know, when I call solve Sudoku. So I'm going to do the same thing here. Um, I'm going to call translate uh, puzzle dot translate givens. There we go. Now, this is our first region. What is the second region? The second region uh, starts at alpha 2 string. Alpha 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, okay, that's, okay, the bottom of the video is going to be a bit uh, annoying to fill, but that's okay. Uh, so this is 2, 4, 6. This is bravo 6 and 7. All right, so that is the second region. Then let's do this region here. So we start at uh, Bravo 2, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, and then we have Charlie 5, 6, 7. And then we have Delta 7. Um, oop, and there is one that I missed almost, Delta 5. OK. It should probably, you know, now that I think about it, a jigsaw Sudoku has to have regions of exactly nine, uh, right? So actually, I'm going to make sure that all of these are exactly nine. So if affected cells uh, count is not equal to nine, let's uh, throw an argument exception here. Um, the region is um, does not cover exactly nine cells. There you go. And, uh, ooh, I just realized I never actually put in the, um, you know, the string for zero. here. So I'm going to go string.format uh, and uh, put the region there. There you go. And then obviously I need to do the same thing. Um, welcome back. OK. Um, anything else I've missed? Um, let's hope not. Okay, so we need the next region here. So the next region is going to start here, which is Charlie 2 uh, to 4. So that covers uh, these three squares. Then we have Delta 2, 3, 4. And then we have Echo 3, Foxtrot 3, and Foxtrot 2. Uh, next, we're going to start here. This is H, so hotel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 5. And then we want golf 3 and 4. In fact, I'll just do golf 3, and then here we're going to have uh, echo foxtrot golf 4, like that. That works. And the next region is going to be the one on the far right. So. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's uh, India, one, two, six. Um, and then we have golf, five and six, and hotel six. That's that one. Finally, uh, well, not finally, there are three more to go. Uh, so Bravo, Delta, Echo. So this is Echo five. Echo. So here we can actually do this and cover the entire two by three uh, rectangle here. And then this is delta six and uh, golf and hotel seven. Uh, so that's those. And then on the bottom here we have these are literally just two rows. So it's going to be bravo to Echo um, eight and alpha to echo nine. And then finally, here we have hotel seven followed by um, foxtrot uh, to hotel eight and foxtrot to hotel nine. I, I suppose I can just do that. It was a rectangle. All right. Let's see, what do we have? Man, now I want to try to make some automated solvers myself. Uh, that would be um, awesome if you could do that. 
Uh, Goofy, yes, this is correct, because if we go back to the um, place here, you will notice that I look at both column ranges and row ranges, and I have this nested for loop. So if I, if I do this, e to f5 to 7, it will actually uh, do the entire rectangle. Right, so it will go from e to f and from 5 to 7, first cover six of those squares. All right, so I think that this is our jigsaw Sudoku. Let's run this. And of course, we have a problem here. Ah, okay, our test here obviously needs to translate these givens. There we go. And then we run this. Okay, we have a region that does not cover exactly nine cells. Let's see, hotel seven is this. And then FGH, aha, it should go from Echo. Wait, oh, it should be India, not hotel. Aha. India. Uh, wrong, wrong. Let's go to uh, program is what we want. This needs to be India and this needs to go to India. A, B, C, D, E, F. Yeah, this goes from Foxtrot to India. Okay, so it finds tons and tons of solutions. In fact, it finds like literally every Sudoku. Right, you will notice here that it starts with the numbers from 1 to 9, and this here is. Ooh. Um, oh, okay. I, I, I guess I forgot to specify the givens. It, it does seem to actually um, uh, honor the regions, right? So th this here, uh, up to here. Oh, no, it does not honor that region at all. Okay, so we have a bug on our hands. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to see if this uh, algorithm that translates these strings into uh, givens, in, sorry, into regions, actually works. So I'm going to go here, look at my um, uh, affected cells thing. And the first region, which is this one here, uh, should cover... Ooh, that is obviously not correct. All right. Um, okay, I've spotted the mistake. Um, could you color tint the regions? Uh, yes, I could color tint the regions in the output. That is actually a very good idea. I was actually going to do that, uh, give those constrained objects a, um, a property that will allow them to be colored in the output. Okay, so the problem here is that, you know, I... Uh, this is obviously the uh, top left corner of the column and row in any region. But here in the for loop, we've called it C and R. So I have to call this C and R as well. Now, if I run this, uh, we still have problems. That is very bizarre. Well, let's uh, just run this again. Okay, so at least um, it's not all zeros anymore. Um, so this seems to be correct. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that region is definitely correct. Um, let's take a look at the first uh, solution that it outputs um, and see if it honors the regions. Uh, yep, as you can see, the top region has the 8 and the 9 in the right place. So in order to take a look at this, um, um, you know, in order to debug this, I am going to do exactly what Goofy just suggested, which is to color the regions. So I'm going to um, add a, a function here to the constrained abstract class, which allows me to say, um, okay, I'm going to use console colors, obviously, because I'm outputting this to the console, uh, make it a nullable one, because maybe we don't want to, um, uh, color, you know, we don't want to color every constraint. Um, and then let's see if we want to color a cell. Uh, and for the index, right. Now, uh, the other ones I made abstract because I definitely want every constraint to implement this, but most constraints are not going to get colored. You're not going to color the uh, givens. Actually, I suppose we could actually color the givens. Yeah, let's color the givens as well. So we're going to use uh, text color to color the givens and background color to color the uh, regions. How about that? So we're actually going to have um, cell color and cell background color. But what I was going to say is that I don't want these to be abstract because most constraints are not going to use colors. 
So I'm just going to make them virtual, uh, which means that I can give them a default implementation, and the default implementation is to just return null. So by default, constraints will not color anything, but then in my given constraint here, I can um, uh, I can override the uh, uh, the cell color and return. Oh, I don't need to put return there and make it white, right? So it'll uh, stick out from the light gray, which is the default. Now for the uniqueness constraints, this is a little bit uh, more interesting because. Uh, the uniqueness constraints don't know where in the list of constraints they are. So I need to give them some kind of um, ordering, if you see what I mean. So um, how do I best do this? I guess I am actually just going to say that this can have a, a background color, and I'm going to assign that color outside of this class. right? But then here, uh, the background color thing, I can just return that. So once again, you know, if you don't do anything, then this will default to null, this will return null, and it will not be colored. So that way, the um, row and column constraints, which are, of course, also uniqueness constraints, will not be colored. But then here in, um, uh, in, in, in Puzzle, where I generate the Jigsaw Sudoku, uh, this thing, will know uh, where it is, right? So I can, you know what, I'm going to move the Latin square constraints to the bottom. So at this point, the number of constraints in that list is also uh, usable as a, um, uh, as a value. So I can just take uh, the, I can just take the current count of constraints but I have to add one because obviously it'll start at uh, zero, which would be black, All right? Actually, I suppose I could uh, color one of the regions black, but I think it's going to be prettier if I start at blue, which is the first color. All right, so now we have that. Uh, the next thing we need to do is we need to be able to output the Sudoku in such a way that it actually honors these colors. Because if I run this now, it'll still not be colored because it doesn't use the colors. So I am going to um, see. Mm. So this is interesting because uh, our solve um, function here uh, currently only, contain, uh, only returns the integer array, which is literally just the solution. It doesn't know about the colors at this point. Um, but um, Let's see. So for the jigsaw Sudoku, um, yeah, how about this? I'm going to return an, a tuple containing the integer array, which is the actual solution, and the console color array, uh, which is to be used for the background colors of each cell. How about that? Um, so for each solution here, uh, I'm going to have a solution. I'm going to want to return a tuple, which contains obviously the solution, as well as uh, the numbers from, you know, all 81 numbers. Uh, and now I need to find the uniqueness constraint uh, that is at that position. You know what? I'm going to do this. Our background colors equals new uh, console color question mark um, uh, size which is 81, obviously. And then here, when I add the constraint, okay, I, I just realized that when I do, if I do this, then, I, then the uniqueness constraint won't even need to know about its background color. I kind of wanted there to be um, a way to, um, oh my gosh, okay. Here's what I will do. I will, I will change this around completely. Um, instead of solving uh, the Jigsaw Sudoku right here, I'm just going to say generate a Jigsaw Sudoku and return it as a puzzle object. And then the caller can just call dot solve on it. So here I only need to return the puzzle. This is a much better way to do it. 
So here, I'm not going to solve the Sudoku, I'm just going to return it uh, and translate here, this is fine. Okay, and now I can add a function to the puzzle class that will output a solution to the console. Yeah, let, let's do that. So here in our program, right, so we want to create this. So we now have our jigsaw sudoku, uh, which we can just dot solve. Except that, yeah, I, I, I want the uh, puzzle. So, okay, so now we have our puzzle object, which represents the jigsaw sudoku, and then we can uh, tell it to solve itself. And then um, here, instead of this, I'm going to say uh, puzzle dot write to console, write solution to console solution. Oof, okay, so now I can generate this method, which will, um, you know, actually maybe I shouldn't, Solution to uh, console string. Let's do that, right? And it'll return the console colored string. Whoops. Console colored string. There you go. Okay. So this is what I'll do. So the puzzle type will just allow me to turn it into a console colored string, right? And we're going to return the solution split by nine. So now we know what row we're in, and then for each chunk. Uh, that select um uh, oh um okay so we have a value in a specific column okay so i want to take that value um to string i want to add a space to the value because you know so this doesn't need that also i want to join colored string there we go um, and then I want to color this with, um, so the foreground color, I'm just going to leave it at null. No, 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 actually I need to, ooh, okay, find color. I need to find the color. Okay. Um, um, all right. So find a uh, color for the cell at uh, column row and then find the background color at column and row. There you go. Okay, so now let's write these functions. So find color is going to take a specific position, which actually now that I think about it, I can just do this because um, you know in in future if I want to create more puzzles that aren't uh, rectangles, um, then uh, you know I want find color to be more um, generic. Okay, so I want to return. So for each constraint, uh, yeah, let's actually just go through the constraint. For each constraint in the list of constraints, if um, constraint dot, yeah, let's just get var color equals constraint dot color, cell color at this index. If that is not equal to null, then return null. Uh, if all of them are null, return null. Now, there is a way to write this in a single line. Uh, we can just take the constraints and aggregate them. And we start with uh, null. Uh, we start with a console color nullable null. And then every time that we find a constraint, so this is the constraint, um, we're going to take the previous value. If it, is, if it is still null, then we can ask the constraint, which is C, uh, to color the cell at index. And that will do that. Phew. Okay, now we can just copy this and uh, make it the background color. Uh, so here, cell background color. And that's literally otherwise the same thing. Okay, Phew. So now we have this function, which by the way, I can also um, you know, write in a, ooh, it's, ah, okay, uh, there we go. I can write that uh, like this, use as much less space that way. Okay, and now we're just going to call that. So here in our program, 
instead of this, we're going to say, oh no, this is what we want. And we're just going to go console util. Come on, there you go, dot write line that. Okay, now let's see if that works. Puzzle does not contain, oh, okay. Um, puzzle dot, okay, this should just be called Sudoku. And then here I should go solve. Bingo, okay. So that is still um, problematic, obviously. Um, let's find out why this is happening. So um, this sounds like, oh, oh, I see. Um, let, let's take a look at this uniqueness constraint thing here. Um, you see, I return the background color in all cases, but actually I want to return that only if this index is one of the affected cells. So if affected cells contains that index, then background color, otherwise not. And bingo, now we finally have it. All right, now let's try the same with the givens, right? The given constraint, um, let's see. Um, uh, if index is equal to the location, then we want wise, otherwise null. Um, ah, okay, I need to... Oh, wait, maybe I don't want white. Oh, yeah, I do want white. Uh, okay, so let's make that nullable. There we go. Okay, now, however, it seems that the givens are not showing in white, which suggests that I actually forgot to um, include the givens. Um, one of the regions has a white background, the numbers in it are unreadable. Yes, yeah, I, I figured, I, I realized that. Um, uh, let's see, uniqueness constraint. Okay, so um, first I want to make the givens appear in white. Uh, why aren't they appearing in white? The reason they're not appearing in white, and also the reason why my whole algorithm isn't working, is because here I forgot to add the bingos. See, I added the uniqueness constraints and the Latin squares, but not the given. So for each, um, uh, or actually, I suppose I can just constraints dot add range translate givens, uh, givens. There you go. Uh, oh, I see. They are already translated because they're given as a integer array. Uh, ooh, okay. Um, givens, givens, givens. Uh, okay, so constraints dot given givens there. That that's what I wanted. Oh, and that only takes a string. Ah, uh, dude. Um, yeah. Let's make this an a uh, nullable integer array, and then you have to use the translate givens thing if if you want the uh, um. You know, now that I think about it, why doesn't the translate givens function just return the constraints? I, I, I'll, I'll take care of that later. Okay, so um, I want the givens. Um, so first of all, if givens is null, I want an argument null exceptions. If givens.length is not equal to, oh, I cannot actually check the length here. So um, I guess I'll just have to make do with this. So uh, givens.length. Uh, let's rename all of all occurrences of that. So if given of i is there you go. If given is not equal to null, there you go. And this should be dot value. This might be more readable. If I um, uh, do this, if givens i is equal to null, then just continue here, and this is much easier to read. There you go. So if it's between one and nine, then we have the constraint, and if not, then it's um, oh, the given constraints must be between one and nine, or null to signify no. Okay. Now, if I recompile, I bet that there's going to be some place. Oh, okay, that's uh, uh, right. So here, I want to just put the given. I don't need that. Um, that's all right. Can I run this? Built a good. Okay, it seems to take a moment.
And there we go. Okay, so now the kittens appear in white. It takes 5.2 seconds to output uh, to, to find the uniqueness, to prove the uniqueness. And now I guess I want to make sure that I can actually see the numbers in this region here. So I need to avoid the background color 7, which is what that is. So in um, puzzle here, when I generate my jigsaw Sudoku, um, here I convert this. So I'm going to say um, convert to color um, background colors dot count, and I'll I'll just make a tiny little function like uh, static uh, console color, oops, console color. Uh, convert to color um, in uh, number. I'm not quite sure why it doesn't seem to like this. Hmm, okay. Uh, if, let's see, if, uh, so first of all, we're going to just increment it so that we start counting at one, and then if that number is greater or equal to seven, we're going to increment it again, and then we're going to convert that to a console color. Okay. Um, dot. um, this, I, I want constraints, dot count. there you go. Okay, finally, there you go, that took 0 0.8 seconds to find and 2.9 seconds to prove it's unique. Uh, still a bit difficult to read here because it now has a bright green, but there's not really much I can do there. Um, I suppose what I could do is, um, nah, it's fine. I, th I think this is okay. Okay, so let's go to the end of the video and see if the solution is correct. And we see uh, he hasn't quite finished it yet. Uh, there we go. All right, 36489152718937426. This looks correct. 75164239. That is correct. Everything is correct. All right. We've got our solver for jigsaw Sudokus. So far, so good. Now, the next thing I'm going to do, I, I suppose I can close this uh, tab now. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is a no-touch Sudoku, which is literally the same as Sudoku, except that you can never have the same number uh, diagonally adjacent from each other. So for example, if you, know, you have an eight here, uh, that number diagonally across the line also can't be an 8. So that 3 here rules out a 3 from being here. That 7 rules out a 7 from being here. So without that constraint, I expect this puzzle to be um, awesome. uh, ambiguous. At the moment. So hey, the rules on... It didn't let me pause the video there. Okay, let's pause it here. There you go. Okay. Um, the very start. Okay, so let's first write down the givens. Uh, actually, wait, before I do that, I think I want to put that uh, jigsaw Sudoku into my collection of, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, tests, unit tests. Come on, no, I want this. Thank you. Okay, so public void test jigsaw Sudoku. So here's the puzzle. Um, which is that, and then var solutions equals puzzle dot solve dot to array, which obviously I can literally just put here, just like I did in this line here, and then I just want to check that it is not null. There is exactly one solution, and the solution is, um, yeah, let's just run this. Okay, it takes 2.9 seconds to find that. I, I don't know if that's uh, problematic if a unit test takes that long. Um, but, you know, if it becomes a problem, I can still revisit that later and maybe add uh, some extra givens to just make it run faster. But for now, let's just do this. So the solution needs to be this. Bingo. Okay. So that's our jigsaw Sudoku done. Now I can get rid of this here. Okay, so now we want a no touch sudoku and we're going to translate the givens all right the givens are four one two three five two four five three one six two nine two 
Uh, any more comments? Um, no. Okay, so these are our new um, constraints. So let's put them all in one line. Not constraints, these are the givens. And there's, there seems to be quite a lot of givens. So this is probably going to be one that, um, uh, that it will solve pretty quickly. Now, uh, just for the laugh of it, I'm just going to have it solve this as a regular Sudoku. And this should output more than one possible solution, right? And it doesn't. It finds no solution at all, which strongly suggests that I made a typo. Like, um, let's check this. Uh, four, five, five, three, one, six. Ooh, there are actually two twos in this row. So that is indeed an impossible Sudoku. Um, so I'm not quite sure how that works. I did type it up correctly though. So I guess we're going to have to listen to the beginning of the video. Hello. Um... To have uh, um, Mark tell us the actual rules. Welcome to another Cracking the Cryptic. Today I'm going to have a look at another variant Sudoku from the recent Sudoku Grand Prix competition. Um, this one's called No Touch Sudoku. Ooh, I've just realized I've got two of the givens in the wrong place, and let's just correct that Bingo. before we get started. Okay, so <laughs> I did copy it down correctly, but it was given wrong. Okay, so these are the correct givens. So let's do that again. Um, put these givens here. Now, if I were to solve this as a regular Sudoku, I am still getting zero solutions. That is... Weird. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I see this. The six should probably be up because I noticed that, uh, you know, uh, apart from that, it's symmetric. So let's see if he moves um, the six. I've up. got several of them in the wrong place. There. Ah, yeah, bingo. Right, sorry. Okay. So that six should actually have been here. So my algorithm was completely correct the whole time. It correctly identified that there was no solution because the puzzle was contradictory. And now, of course, it will find multiple solutions because it does not, uh, um, it does not satisfy the um, touchy constraint, the no-touch constraint. So if we take a look at the first solution, we should probably find a contradiction here. Uh, there we go. We have a 7 and another 7. And in fact, there are quite a few... Uh, violations here. Uh, probably the 6 is in the wrong place too. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, we, um, uh, the, the chat is of course a little lagged uh, compared to the stream, or rather the stream is lagged, so I apologize that I don't get to your messages in time. But yes, you, you were correct, that, that was indeed the reason. Okay, so now let's implement a no-touch Sudoku. So let's uh, generate a new method, which will give me a new puzzle with givens, and I'm going to move this uh, down to uh, here after Jigsaw Sudoku. Okay. Uh, implementation. Okay, so we literally just want a standard Sudoku with one extra rule. Um, so let's See, if, if, if I would just take Sudoku, it will give me the puzzle, and then I'll be able to modify the constraints array by adding an, an existing, sorry, an additional constraint to it. So I guess that's what I will do. So um, var Sudoku equals Sudoku uh, with those givens, and then Sudoku dot um, constraints. Okay, now this is currently an array, and I, I'm wondering why did I even make it an array? Why don't I just make it a list so you can just um, add to it? So here, this is going to be 
So why don't I just add range um, that, I guess, and then also all of these. Okay, that's slightly more readable. Yeah, okay, so this adds the Sudoku constraints and this adds the givens. Uh, that is indeed what we want. So now we can literally just, um, okay, so here, a follow up constraints is actually a list, so I can literally just, um, you know, I can actually just, here, here's what I'll do. I'll instantiate this at the very start, like here, uh, maybe underneath that function, there we go. And then I don't need this list here. I can just use puzzle.constraints here, here, and here. And there we go. Okay, so here I'm going to uh, add a single constraint, which is the no touch constraint. Um, so the question is, so should I have just one class for the no touch constraint that applies to the entire puzzle, or should I make a no touch constraint that can apply to a region um, you know what, I can extend the class later. So for now, I'm going to have a single constraint for the entire puzzle. Okay, so um, we have a given constraint. We're going to change that to no touch constraint. Uh, let's go in there. We name that. Uh, it does not have a location. It does not have a value. Uh, mark initial takens. There are none. Uh, it does not need to mark any initial takens, but when a value is placed, we are going to mark the surrounding cells as having that be taken. And also we don't want to color anything with this. Okay, so x is going to go from negative 1 to 1, and y is going to go from negative 1 to 1. So that will cover a 3 by 3 area. Um, and then I'm going to say if x is not 0 or y is not 0, then taken, uh, um, okay, we also need to make sure that we're uh, still within, uh, yeah, okay, so here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll rename this to delta x and uh, delta y, and x and y are going to be, whoops, are going to be the um, actual x and y coordinate of the place where we are. Oh, and this needs to know the size of the grid. So I'm going to, uh, not string int. Um, so this time we need not so much the size of the grid, but rather the width of the grid, because that is what we need to modulo and uh, uh, divide by. So I, I suspect that it will probably help if the uh, row and column constraint will also take a grid width and height so that you know I can apply it to grid, grids of different sizes. But for now, let's, um, let's go with this. So if I modulo this, I get the x. If I divide this, I get the y. OK, so now I need to make sure that this is the case. And uh, x plus dx is greater or equal to 0 and less than uh, the grid width. I think I need the grid height as well, because otherwise I'm going to go off the bottom of the grid, and I don't want that. So I want um, y plus dy to be greater or equal to 0 and uh, less than the grid height. If all of that is the case, then taken uh, for the cell, the cell is now x plus dx plus 9 times uh, y plus dy, um, and the uh, value, there you go, true. Okay, this should work, and it just occurred to me that because I never look at taken again, I don't really need this condition. I mean, after placing a digit, I don't look at the taken array again, so it doesn't matter. So let's just do that. I can also make this slightly faster if I move this condition to here so that it doesn't go through the, uh, the Y loop um, when it doesn't need to. Did I tell you that I'm running a font making business? And my friend ordered a Comic Sans font that's, <laughs> that, that's funny. Um, no, you did not tell me that, but um, that, that's quite funny. 
Okay, so that will set all of those tables. Okay, and now we just return that Sudoku. And this should just magically work because we are calling the correct function here, we're solving the puzzle. Let's run this. The name constraints does not ex. Ah, oh, okay. of course, we want puzzle.constraints here. There we go. And we have a division by zero because we didn't actually give it the grid width and height. So for the no touch Sudoku, the uh, width is going to be uh, nine, the height is going to be nine. Um, yeah, that's going to be the default for now. And that took less than a tenth of a second to find the solution. Let's run that again. Yep, that is giving me the right answer. Let's go to the end of the video and compare. We have 419258736. This is working just fine. Okay, so Notar Sudoku, as you can see, was a breeze that worked um, beautifully. Um, let's see, what does that look like? Um, oh, the font. Uh, go, go ahead and you guys uh, uh, discuss that while I make this into a. Uh, unit test. So I, I guess I'll just copy this, go here, um, make a, um, oh, I forgot to mark this as a test. Let's mark this as a test, public void test uh, no touch sudoku. All right, we want our solutions solve to array. And we want this to be equal to this. All right, let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of the spaces and the new lines. And this is what the solution should be. Boink. Okay, we now have three unit tests. Um, let's see if I can literally just um, run these tests. I'm a bit surprised that it doesn't let me run these tests. Uh, aha. Okay, it has noticed the test. So if I click this, bingo, I can run them here. And it doesn't seem to run them. That is weird. Run all tests. Okay, did, did that run into a problem? It says here no issues found. Test run finished in 95 million, zero total tests. Okay, I didn't actually run them. I, I, okay, I don't know why it didn't run it, but um, I'll, uh, I, I'll, I'll take a look at that some other time, because that's not really part of what we need to do here. Let's move on to the next uh, Sudoku variant. We have a thermometer Sudoku. Now, the thermometer Sudoku is a variant in which uh, the cells along the thermometer have to be in increasing order. So let me just show you the solution uh, so you can see what I mean. If you look at this middle um, uh, thermometer here, you can see that the numbers go three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They don't have to be consecutive, so it could have been one, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That would have been valid, but they have to be in increasing order. And you can see that all of these thermometers have values in increasing order. Right. Um, here is another. Uh, thermo variant, um, which is seven. Uh, if I go here, right, it has multiple thermometers of different shapes, so they can sort of take a bend. And you can also have sort of two thermometers that uh, share the bulb. So it has to like increase upwards here and also increase along here, which means that the bulb is going to be the lowest value. And indeed, if we look at the solution, you can see up here it goes one, two, three. And down here it goes one, four, and then up to nine. Okay, so we're going to uh, do this one first though. Now, the thermometer Sudoku, if you think about it, is actually just a series of less than greater than constraint. So one such thermometer is just telling you that this cell is less than that cell, that cell is less than that cell, that cell is less than that, less than that, etc. So, uh, we can treat this the same way as we would a greater, greater than less than Sudoku uh, by just saying that between those two cells, there is this greater than or less than 
constraint. Um, so I'm just going to call it a less than constraint because obviously a greater than constraint is just a less than constraint with the cells swapped. So it's going to turn out the same. So let's, let's create a new constraint here, a new class, which I'm going to call a less than constraint. Okay, um, this is a uh, public class and it derives from constraint. And we need to implement make mark initial takens and mark take. All right. Now, I am. Hmm. Here is the thing. Let me let me quickly tell you uh, something. All right. So if we have a Sudoku, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So let's say you have a less than constraint between these two cells and then another one and then another one, which is what a thermometer would basically do. Um, in order to mark your initial takens, so you kind of want to take into account that uh, this cell now can no longer be a one because obviously this cell is going to be at least a one, right? So um, uh, while this can be one to nine, this can only be two to nine, this can only be three to nine, this can only be four to nine, this can only be five to nine. But then of course, because this here can only be at most nine and this one has to be smaller, that has to go eight, seven, six, and five. So this is kind of what I want the initial takens to be. But in order to do that, the less than constraint class needs to know about all of the less than greater than constraints within the puzzle, or at least uh, every sort of contiguous chain, right? And because of that, I'm going to make this class represent a chain of less than or greater than constraints. And, you know, it will allow you to specify separate less than greater than constraints, and it will make the solver less efficient, like it, it will uh, take longer to solve this. So, um, let's uh, find out what we need. So the less than constraint needs a series of cells. So we're just going to have the same as we had before, an array of affected cells. And this is going to be assumed to start with the smallest one, okay? Uh, so every um, cell is assumed to be greater than the previous. In other words, the cells must be in ascending order. Right? The, the values in these cells must be in ascending order. Okay, so that's, uh, that, that's how we're going to represent that. So now our initial takens are going to be as follows. Uh, we have a min value. I strongly suspect that at this point we also need the max value because um, you know, we, we want to be able to do this where it knows that this can only be five. And in order to do that, it needs to know what the maximum value is. So uh, let's get rid of this. Okay, so I'm going to have to add this max value thing here. And the compiler will uh, certainly tell me to add it to all the others as well. Okay, so in a chain of n uh, cells, right, the first one can only be between min value. Uh, actually, let me write it like this. Okay, so the less, uh, the the first one, which is the least of the four, it can have the min value, right? But then the max value, it has to subtract one, two, three. Okay, so it would, so this would be nine, eight, seven, uh, six, actually. So it's actually minus four. And four is, of course, the length of this, right? So I'm just going to call that n. Um, let, let me think about this again. So if if this is at most a nine, eight, seven, six, it's actually minus three. So it's actually that. Okay, and then similarly, this is of course minimum plus uh, uh, plus uh, n minus one. Um, yeah, sorry, right, it's that all the way up to the max value. I, I shouldn't use a minus sign here, but you know what I mean. Okay. So that means that we, we're going to go through the cells from start to finish. And at each point, we're going to increment what the minimum value could be. 
uh, and what the maximum value could be, and then mark the takens that each of these cannot be. All right. So for i going from zero to affected cells length. Um, so var initial max, but I'll just call it max, all right? So we start at max value minus n, which is affected cell length plus one. So if there is actually only one affected cell, then this will literally be max value and the constraint will basically be uh, ineffectual. So I think this is what we want, right? And then min, we start at min value. So for the first affected cell, we're going to say that takens of uh, that cell, um, we want everything less than min value and greater than max value to be set to true. All right, so I'm going to go through the values uh, from zero to uh, takens. Uh, yeah, I, I need the length of this array. Uh, I'm probably going to be writing this a lot, so I'm going to make that variable. Okay. So for each value that the cell could possibly be, uh, if that value is less than the minimum or greater than the maximum, then uh, say that it's taken. So we're going to say uh, t of that value is uh, true. Okay, and then we're going to increment both of these and uh, process the rest of the cells. All right, so that should be working. Now I'm very quickly going to make sure that this works by actually just, um, let me comment out all of this and just instantiate such a constraint. Um, I just wanna see if this works. So if my affected cells are um, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, Right, and then I have a taken array, oops, taken array, which is um, an integer, uh, no, it was Boolean, right, and size at this point can be five, I guess. Um, and then I want each of those five arrays to be, you know, nine Booleans. Okay, and then I want to mark initial takens in that array uh with min value one max value nine okay i think um see here is the thing min value is going to be i mean these values are going to be one and nine but within the takens array we want to index by the, yeah i think i'm going to subtract min value here because we want this to go from you know zero to eight no matter what the min value actually is um Uh, except that here, we also need to compare this. No, no, we, yeah, it, wait, mm, this needs to be plus, right, and, and this is, right, okay. So, because val goes from zero to the length of the array, so val is the correct index in that array, so this should not be altered. But of course, since val goes from zero, we have to add min value to make it the real value, which goes from one to nine. Okay, so this will be a value from one to nine, this will be a value from one to nine, and min and max will also go from one to nine because they started at min value and max value. So I think this is correct now. Um, so now I just want to stop the debugger here and take a look at the uh, taken array. Um, ah yeah, okay, so now it's complaining that the other implementations of this method don't have that extra parameter which I added. So I'm going to have to add that everywhere. Um, min value and max value. There we go. Oops. Okay, go back to the program, run it. And now let's look at taken. Um, okay, so the first cell should have um, it should have the higher numbers taken. Yep, there you go. Right, because, whoops, okay, whatever. Okay, so I have, let's see, I have five. I have five, that means there are four less than constraints, which means that there should be four truths. Yep, 
There we go. Okay, that seems to be working. Then the last one here should have the trues at the start. This one has the trues uh, straddling like this and like this and like this. This this is correct. This is working perfectly. Okay. So now we can do a thermometer Sudoku. So let's reinstate all of this code. And we want a function that can translate the or take the givens and then also have a list of thermometers, right? So at each thermometer, I'm, I'm going to, you know, use the same notation that I did earlier. So let's start by translating uh, or putting in the givens. 4, 6, 7, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then we have a 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 5, and then 1s. There you go. All right, not many givens there. The uh, middle area is mostly empty, uh, but that's because the thermometers obviously provide enough uh, um, uh, constraint. Okay, so let's create this method. Let's put it down here after the no touch Sudoku. Uh, we want to return a puzzle, and these are the givens, and then we want uh, the uh, Thermometers. Okay, so these probably should be integer arrays, and I should probably have another translate function that works just like this part here that I used in the jigsaw Sudoku. So um, I'm going to change this to int arrays, and I'm going to change all of this here. I, I'm, I'm going to make that a separate. Function. So I want a function that translates uh, uh, coordinates using a string and using a uh, grid width and height. Yeah, we do need the width because we are multiplying by it here. So we need a grid width. But I'm going to assume 9 as a default value. So for standard size dokus, uh, you don't need to specify it. Okay, so let's um, copy this. Right, var um, uh, cells. So we start with a list of integers and then uh, do this. And then we have cells and we add that. And this should be the grid width. Um, the origin. Okay, so here uh, we would specify the. Yeah, um, expected a column. Uh, uh, letter or a range of columns, G A to D, followed by a row digit. There you go. Okay, that way I don't have to, you know, the the message doesn't have to assume the size. Okay, so this obviously is the um uh, part. That should actually be part, and this should be the string. So um, we return the cells as an array. That looks good to me. Okay, so now here, affected cells equals list of int, and then this would just be, um, yeah, affected cells can literally just translate uh, coordinates uh, of that region, right? And uh, if that is not equal to nine, oh, wait, 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 no. I was going to use that at the call site, so actually I don't need to call this here. So I'm just going to say if the region is not 9, um, then uh, a region does not cover exactly 9 cells. And then I guess I can output the region as a list of uh, integers, which hopefully will be sufficiently clear to the programmer. Okay, and then we add a uniqueness constraint with that region. There you go. And now we can use that same translate coordinate function in any other uh, puzzle that you know has any kind of structure. Uh, so here we are going to. So first of all, we're going to create the puzzle again, and it has standard Sudoku rules. Um, but then we want to add a constraint. So for each bar thermo in thermometers, 
um, sudoku.constraints.add new uh, less than constraints. So here the affected cells are literally just the uh, thermometer, and that's literally all we need. And we just return that sudoku. Uh, sorry, thermo. There you go. Okay. Um, so in our less than constraint, we've implemented the initial takens thing, but we've not actually uh, made sure that it um, uh, that it enforces uh, that the the cells have to be uh, you know in in the right order. So um, I, gu I guess we need to do that as well. So first of all, if uh, affected cells doesn't contain one contains we need the using system but link for that if it doesn't contain that index then uh, we don't care uh, in fact we actually want the index so I'm just going to get the index like this index index of I see because this is an array we have to do this in C sharp which is a bit of an inconsistency and then if that gives us a negative one then we return, then we don't Okay, so now we have the position in affected cells uh, of the index. So we need to make sure that all of the uh, cells before that index are going to be smaller, less than, and all the cells after that index are going to be greater. Which means that, um, which means that for i equals zero to uh, affected cells length. If i is less than p, then we need to mark, uh, right, so if i is less than p, so this means that we are, okay, so we have our, we have our sequence of cells, all right, and we, we have our p somewhere here, and let's say we are putting a value in, like let's say it's five or something, then we need to make sure that both of these are less than five, which means five and up have to be marked as taken. All right. So for each uh, value from uh, the value that we're putting in, <laughs> um, up to and including, uh, no, 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 actually from, we want to go from zero up to and including the value we're putting in and mark those as taken. That's right. So taken. Uh, at that index, which is the affected cell, um, at the value of v is equal to true. There you go. Okay, else if i is greater than p. Um, okay, so now we're talking about the cells that are here, so we need to make sure that these are greater than 5. So we need to make sure that everything up to 5 um, is marked. So that's actually the code that I wrote. So here I need to mark everything from five onwards. So here we need to go from val uh, up to um, the length of this array. There you go. Okay, so let me make sure that this is correct. So if val is five, which would be represented internally as four, uh, then we go from four uh, all the way up to the length of that array and mark them all as true, um, which means that it will only leave the ones that are smaller than five. That, that sounds correct. And then here we start at zero, which means, you know, the lowest possible value. And we go up to and including the value, which in this case is five, and mark those as affected. Now, here is another thing. Um, you see, if you place a 5 here, uh, what we're doing right now is we're saying, well, this can't be, uh, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. But actually, this one can also not be uh, a 6 anymore, right? Because this would have to be at least 6, so that would have to be at least 7. And I do want to represent that. Now, this is going to be a little bit mind bending but I hope that I can uh, do this. So for the um, first one here, right? Let's, let's do this. Okay. So at the moment, the, uh, this for loop, right, goes from five to, uh, the max, which I'm just going to call M, uh, 
uh, and here it goes from five to max. And here I want it to go from four to max, right? Um, now four is going to be okay. So let's see. Um, so I'm I'm going to have to subtract something here, and that something is basically the distance between this cell and the cell that we are placing. And the cell that we are placing is of course p, right? We know that this is p. Um, so uh, i oh, oh yes, and this is this is i. Okay, so the difference here is actually p minus i, uh, which in this case would be two, so minus one. And that is how much I want to subtract. Okay, which means that I can um, undo the parentheses like that. Okay, now this obviously runs the risk of, um, you know, like for example, if you place a one here. Now I'm not saying it would because it already knows that this is at least three. But um, if it did work, if it were to place a one there. Um, then, wait. No, the value that we place here is not. No, it is relevant. Okay, so if we were to place a one here, um, then obviously subtracting m from one, uh, or, or rather subtracting anything from one, is going to give us a value that is going to be out of bounds. So I'm going to have to say if uh, v is greater than zero, greater or equal to zero. Okay. And then similarly here, um, let's let's do the same thing on the other side. So now our i is going to be like, for example, here, right? And so let's say we want to mark a five. So here we are marking five, we're marking zero to five. And then here we want to mark zero to six as no longer possible. Okay, so we're actually going from zero to val plus, um, plus the difference between p and i, uh, which is in this case i minus p minus one, All right? So this time I want to add that, and then I have to make sure that v remains less than uh, the length of this array. I think this should be good. Okay, now there is a simpler way of doing this here because, you know, I can just make sure that it starts at zero if, you know, so that should do that. And then here, I suppose I can say math.min between that length and that value. But now I don't want this to be evaluated over and over again for every iteration of the uh, for loop, so I'm just going to make that a separate variable so that it gets uh, evaluated only once. Now I sincerely hope that this is correct because I've been um, concentrating hard and I'm still not confident that I have not made any mistakes. Uh, let me just quickly test. So if i is greater than p, let's say i is actually just one greater than p. In that case, i minus p is going to be one, so subtract one is going to be zero. So this is going to be val, and um, we're going to go from zero to val. That is correct. I think that is correct. And then for every time that we increment i, this is going to get one bigger. Okay, I think I'm fairly confident about this. Uh, let's try the reverse. If i is here on the left, i is less than p, then um, so here, minus p, plus i, so i minus p is going to be negative one, plus one is going to be zero. So this is actually val. So this one will go from val to the length of the array, uh, from val to the length of the array. Um, yeah, that, I think that's correct. Um, and then for every time that we subtract from i, uh, this goes smaller which is what we want. We want to mark more and more. Yes. Okay. I think this is correct. Now, one last thing. This here doesn't need to be evaluated over and over again. So I'm going to do the same thing here. Um, and just for symmetry, because the other loop has a lesser or equal to. Um, oh, 
wait a second, I did actually do links here instead of my. So actually, I'm going to change this to a less than and then remove the minus one from here. And then now it has the exact same uh, meaning. All right. So, whew. I think that should work. So now let's go back to our program and let's write our thermometers. We have these givens, and now each of these, um, we're going to have to translate the coordinates. OK, the first thermometer, I did not mean to press that. OK, so the first thermometer goes from alpha 2 to 3, 4, 5, 6, alpha 6. And then we have Charlie 3 to 7. And then we have uh, uh, Echo. Echo 2 to 8, and then we have uh, Golf 3 to 7, and finally we have India 2 to 6. Um, okay, now I need to call translate coordinates on each of these. Um, so I, I want a separate um, constraint for each of these. So I want a separate thermometer for each of these. OK, so let's, let's actually do that. Uh, put that here, and then do that, and then that, and then that. OK. This should be our thermometer Sudoku. I'm going to run this now, and it's going to go horribly wrong because I'm so un, uh, uncertain. Um, OK, so there are some, ah, OK. I, I changed the uh, jigsaw Sudoku thing so that it requires regions. So each of these now need a translate. Uh, translate. So you know what? I'm going to make this an array and just, oops, and just uh, select them. So uh, words, puzzle, puzzle dot translate coordinates, words. There you go. And then that should give you an array of what you want. And we solve that. Turn that into an array. So let's let's make this a little more um, like that, and then uh, this is where that call ends, and then we call solve into the array on that. Okay. Whoa, that was quick. All right, it solves this in less than a tenth of well, less than two tenths of a second. Um, so let's take a look and see if the solution is correct. The givens are certainly in the right place and they are marked as you can see. You know, actually, before I check this, I want the thermometers to be colored. Yeah, let's color the thermometers, shall we? Um, each of these, uh, here we go, constraint and list and constraint. So this can have a color. Um, yeah, let's, let's say public. Uh, console color question mark uh, background color right and then here we overwrite the background color thing by saying uh, if uh, the affected cells contain uh, the index then it's the background color otherwise it's just null and that should have been it no because we need to specify it here so I guess bar um, yeah I guess here I'm I'm just gonna I'm going to turn this into a for loop. There you go. So I can use um, console color um, and then just i, except that I want i plus 1 so it doesn't start at 0, which would be black. There we go. OK, and then this can just go here, and then I can get rid of those. And run this. Okay, here are thermometers. Yeah, that is working perfectly. Okay, now let's take a look at the solution. 94860. This is working. This is all this is uh, ascending. This is ascending perfect. Okay, and that worked better than I expected, and it is faster than I expected. So with that in place, I'm I'm going to turn this into a unit test, but I'm also going to test the other thermometer Sudoku, because if I'm not mistaken, that one doesn't have any givens. That's right. So um, we are going to move this to a um, uh, test here. So let's create a unit test. Public void test. What was this called? Thermometer Sudoku. 
Okay. Back. There you go. So this is the puzzle. And the solutions are going to be that uh, dot solve dot to array. Right. And then we want the same as this. There you go. We want to so that's not null. Uh, the length is one. And the solution is um, there we go. The solution is this. Bang. All right. I, I wish I could actually just run the, uh, the unit test right now. I don't know why the uh, test runner in Visual Studio is refusing to run it, but um, uh, we'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take care of that after, we, uh, uh, after the stream. Okay, so let's do another thermometer Sudoku now because the next one doesn't have any givens. I'm going to create another um, version of this, uh, which doesn't take any givens. Okay, um, um, I guess I can make this optional. So, um, if, yeah, I'm going to make this optional. So it, it doesn't, it, it is allowed to be null, but if givens is not null and one of these, uh, so it must be null or have length 31 and contain only to run in null. All right. Puzzle. Um, puzzle constraint at range Sudoku. There we go. So if givens is not null, then we add those givens. All right. You know, now that I think about it, I could have actually just copied those two lines, but um, it's fine. It's, um, it's useful this way. So um, let's let's leave it. Okay, so we add all of these thermometers, and that should be it, right? So I could, in theory, uh, do this, and then add the givens. But that's that's no no better than this. So actually, let's just yeah, I'm I'm gonna leave it like that. Okay, so we don't want our givens anymore, right? Let's uh, close this tab, and here is our next uh, set of. Uh, okay, so we want to. Okay, there's going to be more than these. So I'm just gonna add a few lines. All right, we're gonna start with uh, the top left corner. So it's going to be this one, which starts in delta four. Um. And now it occurs to me that, you know, I, I had, I, I wrote the code with the, you know, I, I can't do this because it doesn't allow me to go backwards. So um, actually what I meant was this, but anyway, I'm just going to write it out, which is uh, not a big issue. B4 and then A4, A3, A2, A1. That's the first thermometer. Then the second one is the one that goes up and left like this. So that one also starts at D4. And then we have d3, d2, d1, uh, Charlie 1, Bravo 1. Uh, then we have this tiny one here, which is um, Foxtrot 1 to 2. Then we have Golf 1 to 2. Um, or rather, no, sorry, it, it would be Golf to Hotel, but I'm going to go Golf 1 and then Hotel 1 to 3. And then Golf 3, Foxtrot 3. Uh, that should be correct. Now this one here to the right. So that's um uh echo it's echo uh echo five uh to India five and then this vertical one here obviously is echo five to echo eight all right then we do this tiny one here which is alpha eight alpha seven and then alpha to bravo six. Then we have this tiny one here, which is Charlie 7, Charlie 6. And then we have this one here, which is Bravo uh, to Charlie 8. Um, and we've done this, so only two left. We start, we, we do this one here, which is India 8, uh, India 7, India 6. And then the last one here is India 8 uh, to 9. And then we want Hotel 9, Golf 9, 
Foxtrot 9 and Echo 9. I hope I did not make a mistake. I, I hope that you guys followed this and um, yeah, I'm sure you will tell me if I messed something up. But if I just run this now, I strongly suspect that this is going to take much longer than the other thermometer Sudoku because it doesn't have any givens. But we will find out. And it turns out, yeah, it is much slower, certainly. Let's see how long it takes. Ooh, 5.3 seconds. All right, that's still faster than I expected. Uh, hello, Blananas, welcome. Uh, you missed quite a bit already. We already did um, uh, Jigsaw Sudoku um, and uh, No Touch Sudoku. And um, I've already forgotten what we've done. And less than constraints, right? So we just solved this Sudoku here, which is a thermometer Sudoku, which says that along the thermometer, the numbers have to be in increasing order. So I'm going to look at the solution now because I want to check uh, my algorithm anyway. And you can see that along this uh, thermometer here, it goes in ascending order, two, three, four, six, eight, right? It never goes back down. Similarly here from the bulb, it goes one, two, three, in this direction and also one four five six seven nine in that direction so that's what thermometer sudoku does uh, and i'm going to verify if the solution is correct and it turns out that of course it is because why would it output a wrong solution and still say it's the only solution that doesn't make sense so we have our um, solution once again uh, which we are going to turn into a unit test all right so here is our thermometer sudoku Here's our unit tests. Um, I'm going to make this plural and um, just to have it be part of the same uh, have it be part of the same unit test. Okay, so we want this sudoku dot solve dot to array. Um, okay, I made a mistake somewhere. Yep, this. Thank you. Solve to array. Um, and then assert all of these things about solution 2. So I want all of these to be that. Blank. Okay, so far so good. I, uh, I guess that's a thermometer Sudoku done. Now, um, the next constraint that I would have to add is sums. Uh, in order to be able to do most of the other Sudoku variants, I need a constraint that says that a certain number of cells need to have a specific sum. In this example here, the sums are along the diagonal. So for example, this 7 here says that those two cells need to add up to 7, and the diagonal down here needs to add up to 72. Um, but obviously there is another variant known as Killer Sudoku, which looks like this which also uses sums, but in these little regions, right? So um, if I open the Sudoku, like this region here has to add up to 12, that has to add up to 15, etc. And you can see there are no other givens. It's literally just those sums. Now, this is going to be a bit more interesting because it's not quite as straightforward uh, to determine which, um, uh, which numbers you can rule out. So for example, if you have a region like this one here, like this 80, Right, you can see here on the right, there are several different possible combinations that this could be. So if I were to hypothetically put a two in here, the algorithm would have to determine that um, you know, all the other combinations are no longer possible. Um, and as you can see, this can still have pretty much any other digit. But now if I also put, let's say, for example, an eight here, it can no longer be uh, these. And then it needs to realize that the remaining cells can only be 1, 7, 3, or 8. All right. So how to do this is going to be quite interesting. Um, and I, I think I can do this. The question is whether I can do this efficiently so that the algorithm actually finishes within a matter of a few seconds rather than taking hours, which is always possible. So this is where I'm, um, you know, jumping a bit into the water and uh, trying out something that I haven't done before. I think that what I should do is for each of these sum regions, calculate the um, possible combinations that it could have. But 
in a case like this, like 72, this is going to have a lot of possible combinations, especially if the constraint is not supposed to also assume the three by three regions, because obviously the, uh, uh, you know, it could be a jigsaw Sudoku with uh, some constraint. Uh, so I, sh I should probably point out that in a killer Sudoku, the rule is always that within the cages, even if they straddle multiple three by three regions, they can still never have a repeated digit. You will notice that the combinations here never have repeated digits. But in this Sudoku variant, repeated digits are allowed, which, which actually explicitly says this here. The diagonals uh, that, that have an indicated sum may include repeated digits. So um, I think I am going to um, do the killer Sudoku first. Because, um, okay, now here's the thing. Theoretically, like purely theoretically, you could represent each of these regions, which actually are called cages, by the way. You could represent each of these cages as both a sum constraint and a uniqueness constraint. So you could have two separate constraints for every cage, in theory. In practice, what I just said about pre-calculating the combinations that it could have uh, would not be possible that way. So I think we should actually have two different types of constraint. One is just a sum constraint, and the other one is a uh, sum uniqueness combined uh, constraint. Because otherwise, I don't... Um, I actually, hang on. Let me think about this once more. Let's say I have just a uniqueness constraint on this, and I place a one here. What could the sum constraint do at this point? It knows the minimum and maximum value allowed in the Sudoku. And we already have the taken array um, updated. Like as soon as I place the one, the uniqueness constraint will say that can't be a one, that can't be a one. So actually, now that I think about it, I am going to have them be separate constraints. And I'm going to... Uh, Okay, so I'm, I'm going to do this differently to how I said. I'm not going to pre-compute the number of uh, um, combinations. Instead, what I'm going to do, let's say I put a 2 here, here of that. Let's say I put a 2 here, and then, of course, the uniqueness constraint is going to say that none of the others can be 2, but the sum constraint doesn't know that. But what the sum constraint does know is that the rest of the cage needs to add up to 16 which is the sum minus the values that were already placed. Okay, so as soon as I put, like, for example, an 8 here, it will know that these need to add up to 8, and that automatically means that neither of them can be uh, a 9, because that would be greater than the sum. It also can't be an 8. And now it occurs to me that the sum is affected by the fact that the values go from 1 to 9, and we're internally representing them as 0 to 8. So that's going to get interesting. Um, but it's actually not that big a deal, because, you know, imagine the correct answer here was um, that, 2, 8, 3, 5. And the sum is, of course, 18. Now, internally, this would be represented as 1, 7, 4, and 2. And then the sum would be 14 which is exactly four away, which is the number of squares, because we've subtracted one from every square, right? So the sum will actually be off by exactly, um, does this work? Um, so I guess what I'm saying here is that the, you know, the, the public surface will define the constraint as a sum of 18, but then internally the constraint will be translated to one which uses the number zero to eight, and the sum of them has to be 14 instead of 18. Yeah, I think that that will work. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. All right. So I'm, I'm going to back out of this. Um, by the way, um, I, I guess I can show you this. You see how the average solving time here is five minutes and it took me 15 minutes? This is why I'm writing algorithms, because I'm much better at that. I suck at this. Look at this. For this 19-minute Sudoku, it took me more than an hour to solve this. So um, writing algorithms is much more fun because they solve it within a fraction of a second. Well, a fraction of 10 seconds, I guess. <laughs> okay. So 
let's get cracking. So we we have the uniqueness constraint already. We we already uh, you know that's already fully functional. So we we really only need the sum constraints. But then when we put in a killer Sudoku, we need to you know realize that every cage consists both of a sum constraint and also a uniqueness constraint. So let's let's do a sum Sudoku first, which doesn't have any uniqueness constraints, and let's not call it killer Sudoku because killer Sudoku connotes this assumption that every cage has a uniqueness constraint. So we're gonna start by um, let's create a sum constraint first of all. So let's oops no 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 don't delete that. Uh, let's create a new class called sum constraint. That is a public class that derives from constraint and it implements these. Okay. Now the initial takens knows about the min value and max value. Um, which means that at this point, so imagine for example we have a cage like this one. Oops, uh, like um, let's say we have a cage like this one here. You know, it can use the min value and max value to determine that, um, you know, because this can be at most nine, that must be at least six, right? So um, it can calculate what the minimum value, so for example, for a big cage like this, right, it doesn't know the uniqueness constraint, but it does know that each of these have to be at least the min value, so all of them have to be at least one. And then you can determine that, uh, um, so, for example, if three of them were one, then the last one could be at most 15. Okay, so th that sounds stupid right here, because obviously you can't have a 15, but, you know, imagine this sum was much, much smaller. Imagine you had a sum of um, 10, right? If this was a sum of 10, then at least the sum constraint can say that, well, if all of these were ones, that would be at least three. So that can be at most seven. And the same is true of every cell, right? So we can do this calculation initially for every cell that doesn't have a given. Uh, and of course, the givens, uh, you know, we don't care about the givens because the givens will later be, um, uh, will later be processed by this. Okay, so the um, min value per cell, uh, and, and we want a max value per cell. Okay, so the max value per cell is, as I said, the min value times the number of cells, uh, which I suppose I need the uh, affected cells and I need the desired sum. Uh, that should be an int array like that. Okay, so the number of I I affected cells times the min value um, uh, minus one, because you know if it's like four cells, then we want three times that. And then we want the sum minus that, and that gives us the maximum that this cell can be. Right? So it's sum minus all of that. And then similarly, this should probably be, um, let's see, the maximum that these can be is, of course, a max value times that. So yeah, it's literally just that, isn't it? OK. So that means that every affected cell has to have a value between min value per cell and max value per cell. So I'm going to go through every affected cell, so for each cell in affected cells, um, and then go through all of the values uh, from zero to Aiken's cell length. Um, if V plus the min value is uh, less than the allowed mean value per cell, which is this one, then uh, that value should be taken. So that should be true. And similarly, if v plus min value is greater than the max value per cell, then also. So these are our initial takens, which will um, you know, which will make sure that, like, for example, if this is a 15, right, it will know that if this is a 1, um, then that can be at most 14. And if this is, yeah, that's right, if this is at most 9, then this has to be at least 6. That's what it is. 
And similarly for small ones, like, um, you know, if we had a two cage, like let's say the sum was five, then it would know that, well, if this is at least a one, then that can be at most a four. All right, so that's the initial takers. Now let's see if we can do this. Now, we probably need to know what the values are in the remaining cells, uh, you know, in the effect that we need to find out which cells have already been placed and what numbers have been placed in there. And the only way to do that is to pass it into this function. So I, I guess um, I'm going to have to, you know, actually pass in the grid here, which is not a big deal. I can do that, but I just, I didn't expect that I will need to do that, but it makes sense now in hindsight. So um, here, Mark Taken is going to take the grid. All right, let's uh, fix all of the code. So uh, hmm, why did we complain here? Okay, so that one needs it, that one needs it, that one needs it, this one uh, needs it, and here we need to actually pass it in. So the grid is called cells here. Okay, maybe I should call it, set, um, I think I should call this one grid. But it's not always a grid, right? Because this is the generic solver that... No, okay, I'll, I'll leave it like this. Maybe I should call this, like, filled in values or something. But, uh, you know, actually, yeah, let's call... Let's do that. Filled in values. That makes the code much more readable. Because now, you know, this, this clearly says, well, if this is filled in, and then here we can clearly say, aha, we're filling that in. So, yeah, that's, that's much more readable. Uh, variable naming is an art form. I found. Okay, so we don't want that promote to Sudoku anymore. We are going to create a sum Sudoku. All right. Okay, now here the issue is that we need um, we need to specify both the sum and the set of uh, um, cells that apply to the sum. So actually, I'm I'm going to um, and I'm just going to use standard Sudoku and then I'm just going to add them myself here. Uh, so let's do this, new sum constraint. And the first one is, um, let's do this one, um, 72. And the affected cells are, okay, so this is literally just the diagonal. So I'm, I'm actually just going to cheat a little here and go like this. Uh, it's i times 10, <laughs> dot to array. So why is it times 10? Well, it's because the first one is zero, and then you go nine steps to go down and one step to go right. So it's, you know, you go down 10 times. And then at the end, uh, you know, this will go from zero to eight. So the last one will be eight times 10, which is 80, which is correct. 80 is the last cell out of the zero to 80, which are 81. Okay, so that's our first sum. And then this one here is a seven and the affected cells are, translate, uh, it's, it's puzzle dot translate coordinates. And I want to translate um, Bravo, sorry, Bravo one alpha two, right? That is that sum. Um, okay, next one is going to be Charlie one Bravo two alpha three and it has the sum of 20 and then we have the sum of five uh, for delta one charlie two bravo three alpha four there you go and then we have a sum of 42 for echo delta charlie bravo alpha five all right that should be correct for those now let's do the ones on the left side here so we have a sum that is um, 16, and it affects the cells 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That would be alpha 6, bravo 7, charlie 8, delta 9. The next sum, I believe, was a 15. Yep, in fact, the next two are 15s. Uh, this one goes from alpha 7, bravo 8, charlie 9. And then we have alpha 8 and bravo 9. Yep, those are just two cells. Okay, now let's do the sums on the right. 
So we're gonna go sum of 10. Um, welcome back, Red Penguin. You seem to be back pretty often. <laughs> um, okay. All right, so the sum of 10 affects um, India 2 and Hotel 1. And the next one is 20 and 23. 20 and 23. So this one starts at India 3, Hotel 1, Golf, uh, Hotel 2, Golf 1. And then India 4, Hotel 3, Golf 2, Foxtrot 1. Um, finally, the sums on the bottom. First of all, we have one that goes down the entire uh, upward diagonal with a sum of 24. We go, let's see, so this is cell number um, 72, because it's 80 minus 8. So that is 72 minus i times 8, right? So minus 8, minus 8, minus 8. So Eventually, we will have uh, subtracted 64. 72 minus 64 is 8, and that is the cell on the right. So that is correct. Um, then we have a sum of uh, 34, I believe it was. This starts at echo uh, 9. Uh, F, G, H, I. Um... Oh, well done. Uh, Killer Sudoku, uh, we'll get to Killer Sudoku afterwards, but Killer Sudoku is the one where you have these cages with sums. So this, these have to sum up to 19, these have to sum up to 18, right? But for now, we're doing this sum Sudoku in which the sums do not have to have unique numbers. So it's just a sum constraint. All right, so we're at the 34. I did that one. Then we have a 19, which starts at Foxtrot. Golf Hotel India. Uh, the next sum is 16 and the next one is 4. So this is Golf Hotel India 7. Yep, that sounds about right. And this is Hotel 9 and India 8. Okay, I believe that that is all of the sums done. And now I need to write the logic for the actual constraint. So if I, um, if I go here, here we go. Okay, so we now know what's in the grid. We know what's taken. But this is the one that we want to uh, modify. I'm starting to think that maybe that should be on the left because that's the thing that gets modified. I'm going to reorder these parameters like that and hope that it correctly reorders them in every other case. But I strongly suspect that it does. I also noticed that I called this one takens in the plural and this one here taken in the singular. So I'm going to change that. Um, all right, let's see where else I have the word taken. Um, all right, I want this one to be takens. Takens. Find all. Takens. Find all. Um, takens. This should we we should be done soon. Um, and there we go. The rest is in RTU token. That's not what we need. Okay, so let's go back to our sum constraint. Where is it? It's over here. Okay. Whew. Okay. We want to know what sum is already in those cells, which is initially zero. And we want to see how many are already uh, in, in uh, how many within the affected cells have already been placed. Um, um, yeah, because this this will also need to know the min value and max value because otherwise um you know the sum will be off because here we've assumed that the sum uh includes the actual min value and max value um so so yeah i i'm afraid i'm going to have to uh modify all of the 
functions again. So uh, mark taken has that. And uh, this one here, this one here, this one here, and this one. Um, and then here, obviously, uh, min value. Here we go. Okay. Um, so going back to uh, um, this. So for so we're gonna go through the affected cells. Um, yeah, for each um, bar cell in affected cells, uh, if that cell has uh, already has a value in it, then uh, let's add it to um, uh, to our sum. So we need the value for that. And let's also count how many there are. Okay. So now we have a sum. Okay. We, we're now going to do something fairly similar to this here, aren't we? So I'm just going to copy the code. So the min value per each of the cells that we haven't put anything in yet is going to be the sum uh, minus the sum that's already in there minus uh, the max value of the affected cells minus the ones that are already. So, um, you know, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start with the length and subtract this, and then this can be a little simpler. So how many do we still need times the max value? That is the most that we can put in there. And then if we subtract that from the sum, um, ah, okay, this needs to be a minus one. So that tells us what the minimum needs to be in each of the uh, required cells. So here it's gonna be the same. We're gonna have sum minus the sum already times uh, still need minus one. And then for each cell in affected cells, if the uh, if that is not yet uh, has not yet been filled in, then we go through the values that that can be in that cell, and if that value is outside of the range, then we set it as taken. Okay, I think this is correct. Let's try it, shall we? Now, this, this time, I really do suspect that the algorithm is going to take a long time to solve this. But I'm just going to run this. Oh my gosh, really? That is amazing, like how fast it did that. Okay, well, let's see if the solution is correct. That's unbelievable. I literally had no I, I seriously expected that for all of these sums, it would have to try out tons and tons of uh, combinations, but it did this valiantly. That is amazing. Okay, that is the correct answer, apparently, as far as I can tell. So we have uh, some Sudoku that can be done in 0.3 seconds. So here, once again, is our solution, and here is our puzzle. So let's go to our um, uh, test thing, and let's Let's duplicate this, I guess. Call it test uh, sum Sudoku, singular. And uh, yeah, we only need this. Okay, let's. Oh, I see. Um, so var puzzle. Let's do that. Add all of these constraints. Uh, yeah. Why am I indenting that? I don't need to indent that. And then var solutions equals puzzle that solve it to array, get rid of the second copy of everything, and put in the solution, which is here. Boink. Okay, so that is a sum sudoku. Um, tests a uh, sum sudoku with no givens and no uniqueness constraints. Okay. Right, so that's that. 
the next thing to do would be a killer Sudoku, which is obviously sums and uniqueness combined. Now, given that it did this so quickly, which really surprised me, I really do think that for this, I really only need the sum constraint and the uniqueness constraint separately, and um, uh, and it'll just work, and it'll probably be reasonably fast. So let's uh, let's do that. Um, here's all our sum constraints from the previous Sudoku. So I am going to yeah. How about this? I have an idea. Okay, so first of all, let's, let's just remove all but one. Okay, so I'm going to create a little function called constraint.killer uh, cell. And this will take a sum, for example, in this case, 12. Come on, 12. And also a uh, set of coordinates, which in this case would be alpha 1 to 2 and bravo, and yeah, bravo 1. And then it will return two constraints. One is the sum constraint, and the other one is the uniqueness constraint. So let's um, generate this method. And let's put it further down because uh, there we go. Uh, killer cell. Cell, it's not called a cell, it's called a cage. And this is the sum, and this is the affected cells, right? And we're going to return a uh, new sum constraint where the sum is equal to the sum and the affected cells is equal to the affected cells, and a uniqueness constraint where the affected cells is equal to uh, affected cells. Now, I think I'm not going to bother with the background color here because uh, these killer sudokus are going to have so many uh, cells. Um, you know, actually, if I do them in a clever order, I can probably do a modulo six and use only the first six colors, which would be uh, blue, green, cyan, uh, magenta, yellow, and red. Um, that's six. I can count. Uh, yeah. So why don't we do that? Yeah, I think I am going to do that. So I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to add a, um, a optional uh, background color here, background color, which will default to null, so you're free to not specify it, and then just put that in here. Okay. Now, how about I have an idea. I'm going to take a screenshot of this, and I'm going to fill this in with colors in paint, and then I will know which colors to give to which cages. Um, so let's, let's get rid of this. We don't need that anymore. Let's uh, put this here. Uh, make this a bit bigger, I guess. And let's have colors. Color, there we go. OK, so the first color is blue. So we're going to, I'm going to make it a lighter blue, but you know, it's still going to be blue, uh, just so I can still read the sum. That's still a bit dark. Okay. Do that. Right, so that's um, blue. that can be blue, uh, that can be blue, uh, that can be blue, that can be blue, that can be blue, that can be blue, and that can be blue. The next color is going to be green. Uh, oops, enter. Next color is going to be green, so that can be green, that can be green. Um, I suppose that can be green. But I, you know, I want to use more colors, so let's not be too tight here. Uh, that can be green. That can be green. And I think that's enough. Uh, then we want cyan. Let's say uh, that can be cyan. That uh, actually green and blue. Yeah, I think I want. Uh, I want other colors in between these. So let's make this one cyan. Um, this can be cyan. And I suppose this can be cyan. The next color would be red. So let's see, uh, let's make this one red. Um, and it turns out now that I won't, I definitely won't need all of the colors, but uh, you know, um, let's, let's just do that. That's enough. And then the next color would be magenta. So I suppose we can make this magenta and just make sure that uh, the remaining uh, cages aren't adjacent to each other. And then those last ones can be yellow. Yeah. 
Okay, that's a nice colorful coloring of colors, of six colors. All right, and now we're gonna have to enter that into our code. Right, now, I am going to hate writing down the uh, coordinates, uh, you know, the, the way that we've, it's gonna be a lot of work. So I am going to do something else. Um, here's how I'm going to do this. I am going to, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is our grid, okay? So the first page of, oh, I do need to specify the sums as well. You know what? Instead of making more work for myself, I'm going to do it the uh, tedious way. So we've already got our first um, page correctly here. And we want that to be blue, actually dark blue. Uh, next one. Let's make this a little smaller so I can read all of the uh, code. Thank you. Okay, so the next one, I'm actually going to uh, fill the ones that I've already. Um, let's give them a dark green, right? So I've, at this point, I've done that. <clears throat> So the next cage has a 13 and it's um, uh, rather to Charlie 1 with uh, Charlie 2. And that one should be green. You know, maybe I should do the blue ones first because um, then I don't need to keep changing the color. So let's, let's do the blue ones first. Okay, so this one has a sum of 18 and it starts at uh, Hotel uh, 1 to 2 and then Golf 2. Right, uh, so that was this one. Uh, the next one has a sum of 19. And it starts as at Charlie 3 to 5, and then Delta Echo 3. Uh, guess who's back? Yeah, like I said, you seem to be back pretty often. Um, that was the 19. Uh, now let's do this little cage here, which has a sum of 10. Uh, the coordinates are um, hotel five and six. That's that one done. Now let's do this one, which is Charlie seven uh, to Echo seven, and it has a sum of 16. So that was that. Then we have the one in the bottom left corner, which has a sum of 12. Uh, that goes from Alpha to Bravo nine. And finally, we have the one in the bottom right corner, which has a sum of 10. And it goes from uh, India 8 to 9 and Hotel 9. Fortunately, the order in which we specify these cells totally does not matter. Like, it literally makes no sense. Okay, so that was the dark blues. Now let's do the dark greens. We've already done one. Um, 13 up here. Oh, that's also 13. Yep, that one was also 13. All right. This is um, India 1, 2. The next green one is this one here, which is 15. And has coordinates um, up to Bravo 5. All right. The next one, which is this one here, has a sum of 10. Um, and it goes uh, golf. Three, four, five. That's right. And then finally, we have this one here with a sum of ten, which we already have. And this one, <coughs> excuse me, is um, Echo uh, Foxtrot eight. All right. That's this one. And next we have Cyan. So dark Cyan. Um, we start with this one, which has a sum of eleven at uh, Echo one to two. Uh, then we have this one here, which is 14 at uh, India, uh, 4 to 6. Um, click, click, click. Do let me know if you spot a mistake that I make, because um, uh, it's actually, uh, you know, easy to mess up on this. So Alpha 6 to 7 and Bravo 6. 6 and 7 and Bravo 6, that's that. And then we have a sum of 9 on Delta... Foxtrot 9, sum of 9. 
Right, that was that. I forgot to mark this one, but I did put it here. Yeah, so let's mark that. All right, that was the dark cyan ones. The next ones I'm going to mark red, which is dark red. So we have a sum of 15 in coordinates. Let's start with this one. This is um, Foxtrot Golf 1, Foxtrot 2. Uh, hello there, Nikki. Welcome to the stream. I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, so that was this one. Then we have 15 here at um, Bravo 223 Charlie 2. And then we have this very interesting shape in the middle here, which is a, a cross. Um, and this wants to be Foxtrot 5 to 7. Now here, it might be tempting to then also say Echo to Golf 6. But this would be wrong because that would count this cell twice and it would then mandate that the sum of 18 would be with that uh, cell counted twice. Obviously, we can't do that. So we have to specify these separately. All right, that's this cage done. And finally, we have a 12 cage oops, with the coordinates uh, alpha, bravo 8, and then bravo 7. Next, we're going to do the magentas. We have a sum of 18 in uh, delta to echo 4 to 5. Delta to echo 4 to 5, that is correct. Um, then we have a sum of 17 on... Uh, this is uh, hotel 3 and 4 and India 3 and a sum of 24 uh, in Charlie uh, 8 to 9 and Delta 8. All right. And finally, we have dark yellow, sum of 17 in Alpha 3 to 4, um, Bravo 4. Next one, sum of uh, 12. This is Foxtrot 3 to 4. Right, then we have Charlie to Delta 6 with a sum of 17. And finally, the last one. Now, in theory, I don't actually need to specify that last one because all of the uniqueness constraints require all of the numbers 1 to 9 to occur exactly 9 times. And that means that the sum will uh, be 405 no matter what. So if you subtract all of the other sums, then you necessarily get the 35. And in fact, we can uh, test this here. You know, I can mark these um, like this. And it will now tell me that the combined sum of all of those is 360. So if I subtract that, and I also subtract 10 cage here, uh, that's a 35. In fact, uh, theoretically, you don't even need like some of these because th this 3x3 three three cage already, not cage, uh, region already necessarily contains the numbers 1 to 9 and will therefore always add up to 45. So actually, this 10 sum is already enough to mandate that the sum here has to be 35. So in theory, um, up to nine of these cages are probably redundant, but that's okay. Let's just leave them in anyway. Um, and I'm also going to uh, put in that last one because I want it to be marked in yellow. All right. So that was just an interesting excursion. So Echo Fox Road Golf. This is golf. Um, I can count. Uh, golf to hotel seven to eight, followed by golf nine and India seven. Right. Okay. And now let's just run it and see how quickly that finds. Oh my gosh. It's so fast. That is unbelievable. Okay. Now, problem is, um, yeah, uh, the only way to test whether the solution is correct is to either test all of the sums and all of the other constraints or to um 
wait a second, this is not correct. I mean, this, this arrangement of sums here, of, of cages, I must have made a mistake here. And none of you noticed that. Ooh. All right, well, let's see what else is correct. All of this, actually, I'm going to go here because I have the coloring here. Let's just restore all of the colors. All right, so the bottom row is correct. The row above that is correct. This row is correct. Uh, this row is also correct. Uh, yep, there is a two green, and that is correct. Uh, this is correct. Um, this is also correct. And this should have two reds here. It seems that it's only the green that is off. Now, it's very interesting that it found a single unique solution despite the fact that I specified the constraints wrong. Okay, so the first green one here, it says Bravo to Charlie. That should have been Charlie to Delta, obviously. And if I do that, it will just as quickly find a solution. And that seems correct, right? This region here has unique numbers, this has unique numbers, and this has unique numbers. I think that's enough to be relatively certain. All right, now I'm not going to enter the solution in this website because obviously that would be cheating. Um, but at the same time, the website has already, you know, uh, run up like 28 minutes of time. So maybe it wouldn't be that bad of a cheat. Um, but anyway, I want to get on with this. So let's replace all of this with that. And now we have a killer Sudoku. All right. So um, this is the puzzle. Um, here, yeah, that's where it is. Okay, so this is a sum Sudoku. And now we have a killer Sudoku tests a Sudoku with uh, some and uniqueness constraints. Okay, so this is our puzzle. We technically don't need the colors, but I, I can't be bothered to. Oh, actually, maybe I should remove. No, I, I can just do that. Later. Okay, so that's fine. Um, and then we need the solution to be this. Boink. Okay. All right, built succeeded. So now we've done killer Sudoku, so we can close this website and we can close this website. All right. Now here is an interesting variant. This time, it still deals. Um, but I it still deals with the sums uh, in um, certain areas, but it doesn't tell us what the sum is. It only tells us that those regions have to have the same sum. Like all of them have to have um, the sum as all the others. So this is going to be interesting, right? So surely the only way to specify this is to specify it as a single constraint. Um, yeah, I think that's it. You have to specify it as a single constraint, and it will have to determine at some point, like, you know, as soon as one of those regions has all of its cells filled, that's when it knows the sum, the sum of all of them, and then it has to act like a series of sum constraints uh, within. So, yes, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that it literally won't care about the sum until it knows the sum from at least one of those cages. And then it will treat uh, the whole thing as a series of sum constraints. How about that? I think I like that. Yes, let's do that. So, I am going to create a um, ooh, equal sums constraint. That's what I'm going to call it, equal sums constraint. All right, so that is a public class which implements constraint. Here we go. And this is going to be a uh, 
um, it, it's going to contain a sequence, or not a sequence, a, a collection of some constraints, but without the sums, right? The sums will actually be uh, zeros. So, um, actually, wait, hang on. No, I shouldn't do this. Um, let me let me quickly think. Uh, what we want to be able to do right during the solving, as soon as any one of those um, things is filled and we know the sum, we basically want the constraint to then know that we know the sum. But when we backtrack, we we want it to. Uh, to be able to undo that. You know what I mean? Like, when you backtrack from uh, a situation in which you know the sum back to a situation in which you don't know the sum because maybe it was the wrong sum, I need the constraint to go back into a mode where it will ignore the sum. So, I think Hmm. The I, it seems to me that the only way to do this is to um create a copy of the constraint object and to pass around the set of constraints with the modified object in it. Oh my gosh, this is gonna get really hard. Okay, so what I'm thinking, let me just show you that in the code. Um, what I'm talking about. Where's the actual solver? Okay, so notice how here in the the meat of the solver. Uh, it will call this function called mark taken, um, which uh, acts on this copy of the taken array. And I'm thinking that instead of having this here, it should also have a constraints copy, right? And the constraints themselves will tell it whether or not it needs copying, whether it needs, you know, right? And then when it, if it does need copying, you know, actually, maybe that, that's it. This function here should return a Boolean to say whether or not it need, uh, needed copying. Um, right, but... Hmm. Okay, um, let's think. Oh yeah, here's what we can do. We can have mark taken uh, return a new copy of the constraint itself, right? And uh, in, in the majority of cases, this will return null, uh, signaling to the solver that we don't need a copy of the constraint because the constraint won't, ch won't change. But um, if it does return a constraint, then the solver will have to create a, um, uh, you know, a copy of the constraint array. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, this, this sounds like it's going to work. Okay, so this can return a constraint, which will be a copy of the same constraint, but with modifications. All right, and in all of the existing, yeah, let me, let me um, change all of these first. So this, this, this is where we're actually going to uh, need to use this. But everywhere else here, we are just gonna return null. Um, Right, so this needs to return null, and here, return null, there we go. This one here needs to return null. Um, this one here. And this one. Okay, so let's write the part of the solver first because, you know, that's going to be basically the most important part. Um, so um, here's the thing, var constraints copy. Now this is going to be uh, the same type as constraints, which is a list of constraints, uh, but we're going to start uh, with it being null. You know, maybe I want to 
turn it into an array. I think I want to turn it into an array because array has this very useful function called array.copy, which allows me to uh, copy parts of an array. I don't think that this has a, uh, see it only has copy to, which only copies the entire list. It doesn't let me copy just a range. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I want this to be a list so that you can freely add to it, but I'm going to, um, uh, oh, oh, of course, I'm going to have to pass around the array anyway, because if this one is going to change it down here, then, right, okay, so we are going to need an array of constraints either way, okay, right, and then here, when I call this function internally, I'm just going to use constraints the list dot to array. Okay, so now we can do this. Okay, so this is going to be an array, but we start out with null because if none of the constraints want to be copied, then we don't need to allocate an array. All right, so var uh, new constraint equals that. Uh, how are you today? Um, I'm fine, thank you. Um, okay, so if new constraint is not equal to null, then we have something to do. Um, so if it is not equal to null, then we need the constraints copy array. So we need to check whether it is already, so if this is actually null at the moment, then we need to um, instantiate it, all right? So we need an array of the same length as constraints.length, and then we need to copy from the source array, which is constraints, um, at the source index zero to the destination array, which is the copy um, at the index zero, as many as we have um, currently processed. So I'm gonna have to turn this into a for loop so that, so that I know the index. Okay, so we have to copy those over and then uh, at the index i, we are going to set the new constraint. Right, else, if new constraint was null, but uh, we've already created a copy, then uh, we need to put the old constraint at that place. All right, and then here, uh, if we did take a copy, we want to pass that, but otherwise we pass the same array. Okay, I want to make a backgrounds module, but mainly to show off my computer background. Okay, enjoy. There's already a contained module called backgrounds, but uh, I'm sure you can, you can call it wallpapers or desktops or something like that. Okay, I think that this will work. <laughs> At least I hope so. I should probably um, put in some comments here to explain how this algorithm works in case I want to read this code later or anyone wants to read this code later. Um, so um, attempt to put the va to put the value into this uh, cell. Um, if uh, Placing this value modifies any of the constraints. Uh, we need to uh, take a copy of the constraints array, uh, comma, but we want to keep the original array. Uh, but for performance reasons, we want to keep the original array if none of the constraints changed. All right, so. Um, we may need to, uh, yeah, um, yeah, a constraint change. That means we definitely need a, uh, a new array, uh, of constraints for the recursive call. All right. Okay, I, I think that's good. Now, um, it appears that we always take a copy of taken. Um, 
technically we don't need to do that because you know it, in, in theory it could be that none of the tokens actually changed but they change so often that it's not worth uh, and and also most of the sudokus that we've done so far you know they took less than a second to solve so i'm actually totally happy with the performance of that part okay now that we have finally done this we can have our um what was the equal sums constraint um and this equal sums constraint is going to have a uh a nullable integer for the sum because that is going to be um, uh, initially null, meaning we don't know the sum, right? And then we're going to have to have the. Um, uh, I just randomly realized. Oh my gosh we can actually have this return a set of constraints not just a single constraint and that means that when this constraint realizes that you know the last uh, number in one of the regions has been placed and we now know the sum it can actually just return uh, a sequence of some constraints i think i'm going to do that so i'm going to change this yet again and I'm going to have it return an I enumerable of constraints, which means once again that um, I'm going to have to change all of these. Okay. Um, okay, there we go, change that. Uh, fortunately, I can still have these just return null. Um, there we go. Okay. Now, here, if new constraint is not equal to null. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to making it a list because now the number of constraints can change and I can just use add range to, yeah, this is what I'm gonna do. All right, so we don't need, um, we, we still need to pass this though. So we still want this to be a list, um, but then here we can literally just pass in the original constraints list. All right, and then here we have a list of constraints. So if placing a value modifies anything, we need to take a copy of the, of the list of constraints. But for confirming, we want to keep the original list if none of the constraints changed. Perfect, all right, so new constraints. This is now a multiple. So if that is the case, then a constraint changed. This means we don't need, okay, so if we, didn't take a copy yet, then we're going to create a new list and we are going to add range. Okay, so we want to add all of the constraints up to here, which is actually constraints.subarray, which I need another using for subarray uh, from zero to i. Oh, please, come on, let me have this. There you go. Whoops. Huh. All right, subarray is not there. Collection extension, it is definitely there. So I'm using part util. Um, why did... Oh. Oh, because constraints is actually a list. I'm an idiot. So I'm actually just going to take i. There you go. That, that, I don't even need subarray. Okay, so I can just take the first i elements, put them into the new list, and then here I'm just going to say add. So we're going to put that constraint back in if it didn't change, but if it did change, then here we're going to add range new constraints. Now notice that this means that the function can also return a, an, an empty enumerable to say uh, just remove the constraint. Uh, we, we're not currently using this, but in theory, you know, you could have you could have it remove constraints for performance reasons. Um, but for now, let's just leave it. Okay. So now, now, at, see, at this point, now I've made fairly significant changes to the algorithm. It would be nice at this point if I could run the unit tests to make sure that they still work. And since the um, Visual Studio test runner doesn't seem to work, I'm going to um, uh, test them directly. 
which I can do by doing, um, isn't this called Sudoku? Yeah, it's called Sudoku. Um, Sudoku.test. Why, why can I not? Hmm. Um, puzzle solver test. I am in the correct. Uh, okay. All right, let's see why it doesn't let me do that. An object references, it's just non static, that's why. Okay. Uh, right, I should probably call it that so it's not as confusing. All right. So uh, let's comment this out. And let's just test all of these. Let's test the jigsaw, let's test the killer, uh, let's test the uh, no touch, let's test the uh, some Sudoku. And let's test the thermometer to do. All right. Um, I want to output something just to see, you know, its progress. And then when it's done, let me see it. Okay, so uh, ah, the jigsaw is the one that took long, and the thermometer is taking a while, but we already knew that. And it's the thermometer is the one that has two Sudokus in it. Bingo. Okay, so they all worked. There are no bugs, at least not yet. I mean, I'm not using the new feature yet, so it's entirely possible that I might still run into a bug. And we'll see. So that's the tests uh, taken care of, and that's this code taken care of. So now we can finally, finally create our equal sums constraint. So our initial takens, we don't actually want to do anything. Right, and we also don't care about the sum, right? But we do care about the affected cells, which is an, a double array because you know we have regions of cells. We have multiple regions. Okay, so actually maybe I should call these regions. All right, now if uh, regions dot any, right? If any of these regions has all of its cells be such that the uh, cell is um, not null, so all of them have been given. So if any of them, uh, yeah, and at that point I will need the, the sum. So actually I'm going to use a for loop for this. So var uh, any found equals false for i equals zero to uh, regions.length and not any found. Uh, so, um, Okay, so if all of the uh, cells in that region are um, given, then the sum is going to be um, regions of i dot sum. Uh, so we want the value from that cell plus the min value because once again, right, um, we mustn't forget that. So that gives us the sum. And at this point, we are going to return a, uh, um, a set of sum constraints. So for each region, right, we're going to create a new sum constraint where the sum is equal to that and the affected cells are that region. There you go. And that will, um, so re return means at this point we're done which means that we don't even need this any found because the return will already, um, yeah, oh gosh, this works so well. All right, this is such little code, if you think about it. It's literally just, you know, a for loop with like two lines in it. This is awesome. All right, now let's see if we can actually solve that Sudoku. So we still need a, uh, oops, sorry, puzzle dot, Sudoku. Right, okay, so we want to add uh, a constraint that is a equal sums constraint. And this will be the first time that we create a Sudoku with only one extra constraint, but it's a big constraint, so it uh, makes sense. All right, so um, equal sums constraint wants the regions. Um, see? You know, I'm going to use a little um, 
uh, utility method I have here. So I can specify the regions inside of here. So um, each region is an integer array. So I'm just going to call, um, what is it? Translate, translate coordinates. Um, so first, do that. OK, so the first one is alpha 1 to 5. Uh, bingo, that's that's already it. And then the second one is Bravo 1 to 4. And then we have Charlie 1 to 3. And then we have, I'm going to do the ones on the bottom next. So we're going to have uh, Golf uh, 7 to 9. Uh, nonsense. Golf to India 7. And then we have Foxtrot to India 8. And then we have Echo to India 9. And then finally, uh, we have the diagonal, which is Alpha 9, Bravo 8, Charlie 7, Delta 6, Echo 5, Foxtrot 4, and Golf 3. All right, now let's run this. Now, I know I've said this multiple times before, but this time I really do expect this to take a long time to solve because it... Ooh, I was going to say, because it blindly fills it in, um, okay, I forgot to put in the givens, that's why. Uh -huh. But we can check whether the sums are equal, right? Even though this isn't what we wanted, we can check if at least the constraint works. So let's see, this sum here is 17, uh, 20, 22, all right? This sum here is 11 plus 7. Ooh, it did not work. Well, that is very interesting. So it didn't actually work. Um, let's see, this is 15 plus 3, that's 18. Uh, and this is clearly, no, this is also 18. So maybe I just missed that. OK, let's check if these are also 18. No, that is way more than 18. Right, that is actually 21. All right, so the 18s was a coincidence. This one here is 17 only, and that one is 19. Yeah. Okay, so my constraint is not working at all. So how do we fix that? So before I put in the givens, I'm going to uh, debug this. So in our solver, I'm going to put a breakpoint here to check what happened the first time that new constraints is uh, not null. Okay, so I get this uh, results view, uh, which mm, is going to be a little difficult to uh, to use the watch list here. Oops, not mean to make that one small. Uh, let's let's maximize this. All right, so um, let's let's take a look at how it deals with uh, constraints copy. Come on, that one. Right, okay, so that's currently null. So we'll create a new list and put in all of the i constraints, which is 27, which is exactly the number of Sudoku constraints, right? There are nine rows, nine columns, and nine three by three things. So these should be the um, uniqueness constraints, exactly. Right, and then we want to add range this. Okay, so now we can take a look at what they are. They are indeed some constraints. They have the sum of 18. This seems to be working correctly. Also, the sizes of the areas are correct, right? This is correct. Uh, yeah, you're going down, so it's plus nine, it's all correct. So that worked correctly. So the question then is why doesn't it um, enforce? Oh, I know why. It's because. What if it has already filled some of the, uh, uh, yeah, if it has already filled some of the other, no, wait, wait, as, as soon as it fills one of them, like even one of them, it, it would replace this with the sum constraint. So you can't have, at this point, we can't have any other region already filled, right? Let's, let's verify that. Let's output the grid. Um, which is actually called filled, filled in values. Let's do a join string on uh, space there. Um, ah, 
Well, that's interesting. So it actually went in order. You see how all of these here are empty and, uh, ooh, okay. Um, let's make sure that I'm reading this. Yes, I am reading this correctly. So it, it actually went in reading order. That is quite surprising. Oh, no, actually it's not surprising at all because we didn't put in the givens, that's why. All right, so we want uh, nine plus eight is 17. So let's put a new line after every 17 characters. There we go. Um, yeah, and then, oh, no, that was wrong. Uh, 18. Okay, and of course we don't really need this. All right, so, uh, the, so the sum that was filled is actually this one here. And indeed, this, wait, 15, wasn't it 18? Uh, let's take a look again. 18, oh. But it's clearly 15. Right? I mean, this is, oh, of course, because this is off by one, because the min value is one. So 15 plus three is indeed 18. Okay, so at this point, it decides that the sum is 18, um, but it fails to realize that this already adds up to 12 plus, oh, sorry, I have okay, seven plus four plus one, plus three, it already adds up to 15, uh, which means that the missing, no, that, that should be fine. Oh, I see. Oh, okay, right. So here's what's wrong. See, the next time that it will visit this cell, which is the uh, last cell on this sum constraint, um, it doesn't check the sum. The reason it does that is because it checks the sum only on the cells that haven't already been filled in. So we would need to um, tell it to update the takens in this cell uh, so that you can no longer have any other sum than the one that we've decided on. And the way to do that is to, um, uh, you know, every time that we call mark taken and then we decide to, um, you know, to return this, we need to run the mark initial takens on uh, each of those sum constraints. That makes sense, right? Now, I am tempted to say that maybe the algorithm itself should do that. Um, hmm. Yeah, I think I'm going to have the algorithm itself do that. Yeah, let's have the algorithm itself do that. Okay, so the reason I was hesitating, let me just quickly tell you this, is because this mechanism of replacing a constraint with another constraint can be used not just to split up a constraint into new constraints like this, but it can also be used to like, um, you know, if, if you want to have a Boolean, like, you know, you know, um, to, to figure out whether the brute forcer has already reached a certain point, um, then you would just create a second copy of this and copy all of the fields over and set the boolean to true. And then at that point, you probably don't want it to um, uh, run the mark initial takens. But the reason I'm still going to do this is because this extra information that you put in can contain information such as a boolean, which will tell this function to do nothing. So it you know, as long as the programmer of this class knows what they're doing, and I'm probably going to, you know, specify that in the XML commentary when I put it in, um, as long as you know what you're doing, it's not going to impact the solver at all. So here we go. Um, let's see. So, um, so new constraints. Ah. No, no, this is correct. This is correct. Okay. So each of these new constraints, I need to run this, you know, mark initial thing on it. Wait a second. No, it's not just that. No, 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 no. It's not just the initial because See, the initial um, takens doesn't care about givens, right? Because the givens are a separate constraint. So it won't know that, um, um, you know, it won't know about numbers. 
Uh, and also, this this doesn't uh, get the, uh, the the grid array, which makes sense because you know this is supposed to be run at the start where there isn't a grid yet. So actually, what I need to do is on each of the sum constraints, I actually need to call mark taken for all of the values that are already in there. That is what I have to do. And also return the constraints so that constraint, yeah, constraints so that the solver will, yeah, okay, so this is what I want to do. Okay, so var uh, new constraints equals that um, dot to array. Okay, and then for each var constraint in new constraints, um, c dot mark taken. Um, oh, yeah. So for each of these new constraints, um, yeah, actually, this is, I, I should just make this a for loop. So for each um, uh, region in the regions, name data var region equals region. Oh, I already do that here. Ah, okay, yeah. But I do, I do want to go over the regions again because I want to turn every region into a new sum constraint. Okay, so var um, region equals regions j. Um, var new constraint equals new sum constraint, and that's the region. There we go. And then uh, new constraints dot mark taken uh, takens. This is the one that we want to modify. Uh, grid. Ah, and now, yeah, we we need to go through right. We need to go through all of the affected cells. Uh, region dot length. Uh, oh yeah, this needs to be capitalized there, obviously. So region dot length. So for each of these cells, if uh, that cell has a, a value already put in then we need to tell it that value uh, with the min value and max value, there you go. And that will mark all of the takens for all of the regions, uh, you know, with the new sum that we are assuming. So that way, if, you know, if this turns out to be a sum that that already violates, then this here will become an empty taken, so it will immediately realize that that's a contradiction. So that, that, that will work out pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to mark the takens for each new constraint, and then uh, we also need to return those. So um, var new constraints equals new list of constraint. Uh, new constraints add new constraint, and then return the new constraints here. Okay, so as soon as this happens, right, that for loop does not continue, which is exactly what we want. Okay, now that should work. Famous last words. All right, here we go. Ooh, now it's taking taking quite a lot longer. Aha. See, it, it, it's taking a long time to find any solution, even without the givens. And that is quite worrying, because that means that with the givens in place, um, no, actually, maybe the givens will make it go faster because it does constrain what can be done. But I'm still a bit annoyed here, or rather worried, that it doesn't find at least one valid solution fairly quickly. But you know what? Um, let's just let's put in the givens and, and see if that works well enough. And if it does work well enough, then I'm okay with it. All right, so here we want the givens. So puzzle.translate givens. And here we go. Here's some more typing. One, two, three, three. Dot, 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 five, dot, dot, three, dot, two, dot, 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 three, dot, seven, dot, one, four, dot, dot, four, dot, dot, eight, dot, dot, um, dot, one, nine, six, two, five, uh, two, seven, And finally, six four. All right, that should be it. Um, these other groups, put them in a string. Thank you. All right, now let's see how that uh, fares. Okay, that found the solution immediately. That is very surprising. Okay, 
So let's see if that solution actually, um, you know, actually, before I look at the solution, let me check if the sums are correct, if, if the sums are equal. All right, so here, the sum is 12 plus 9, which is 21. Uh, here, the sum is uh, 16 plus 5, which is also 21. Here we have 5, 15 plus 6, which is also 21. Here we have 17 plus 4, which is 21. Here we have 10, 5, so that's 21. And here we have 9, 11, 18 plus 3 is 21. And finally, 5 plus 4 is 9, plus 1 is 10, plus 1 is 11, plus 3 um, is 14, plus 2 is 16, plus 5 is 21. We've done it. All right, that is the correct answer. Okay. Equal sums Sudoku. All right, uh, Sudoku. All right, I should probably uh, rename that because I, re I did rename the class, but uh, I should rename the file that the class is in. All right, now we want a test with a um, equal sums Sudoku. All right, boink. Oops. All right, that's the um, that's the solution, which of course I will need eventually. Uh, not like that. Comma. Thank you. Okay, let's um copy all of this into here. Uh, tests a Sudoku in which several regions must have the same sum, but the sum is not given. All right, um, yeah, all right, so var solutions is equal to puzzle.solve.toArray and then all of these. Except, of course, that this needs to be that. Okay, now in our program, I believe that we may be able to undo to get our list of tests back. There we go. And now we can test the equal sum. Oh, not there. Okay, ah, test, there you go. Um, okay. Come on, you can do it. There we go. All right. Now, I didn't pay attention to how long it actually took this um, puzzle to get solved. So I think I want to restore this code just uh, briefly, uh, just to get the, um, oh. um, this one, there you go. Okay, it's actually 0.1 seconds. That is amazingly fast. Okay. So that is demanding equality done. All right, so I'm just going to put that uh, here in the main program so that anyone who runs the program will see the solution. So let's get rid of this, make this puzzle, give that a semicolon. Now if I run this, Bingo. Okay. So let's go to source tree, which is the program that I use to um, uh, to uh, manage Git repositories. And it turns out that there is a, uh, a packages directory that was obviously added because I um, uh, integrated end unit uh, tests there. So we don't want to include that. Um, so let's stage all of that. First working version can solve Sudokus, killer Sudokus, uh, thermometer Sudokus, uh, jigsaw Sudokus. Um, uh, what else have we done? Um, some killer Sudokus. Um, so what else have we successfully completed? Let's take a look at the tests file. Uh, we have, oh yeah, equal sums, and uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, no touch, also no touch. Uh, no touch Sudokus. Um, 
and uh, equal sums to dokus. Okay, so I'm going to um, submit this. Let me take a look at this. Yep, that is already set up. So I'm going to push that to the master branch uh, on the remote repository. And now, here on my GitHub, my Windows is done. Bingo, we have our first um, commit. All right, so today we've written a library that can solve several types of Sudokus, including jigsaws, no touch, some killer Sudokus, thermometer Sudokus, and equal sum Sudokus. Uh, I'm, uh, I thank you all for watching, and I hope that you found this interesting. And uh, please let me know if you want me to stream any other interesting algorithms or puzzle uh, material. And uh, I will see you.